Here's a straight to the core collection of 911 calls, each one pulling you right into the heart of a crisis, from a fake abduction to a terrifying bear encounter. Blood is thicker than water. However, this was not the case for brother John Kalish and sister Catherine Donovan. In fact, there was more than a little blood between the two siblings. In January 2010, 911 operator Milagros Ramos fielded a chilling eight-minute call detailing a seemingly random shooting of four women, including an 18-year-old pregnant teen. Miraculously, one of the victims, Amy Wilson, managed to call 911, despite being shot in the back and stomach. 911, what is the location of the emergency? Oh my god, no one went through in Pottsville. I need help. Someone came in and started shooting. I don't know where I'm at. Long winter's dry. The bird's real. I'm shot. I need help. Okay, Lake Shore. Okay, let's, 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 you're on Lake Shore or Lake Side Drive? Winter Drive. Winter. W I N T E R. Winter. Vanessa. Lisa. My friend Andrew wants to leave the street, Vanessa. Okay, what is that? I'm okay, I'm gonna get somebody to you, okay? I'm gonna get somebody to you. I'm hurt. I know. I'm hurt. I know. Where, where did they shoot you? I'm sorry? Where? Where did they shoot you at? I'm in the shoulder and probably in the back. I can move my legs and my arm. But there's two of all of us that were shot. I'm shot in the arm. I'm bleeding. Okay. How old are you? I'm 33. Okay. They're already on their way, okay? Even though I'm asking you questions, and I know it feels like it's been a while, but they're already on their way. These are just questions that we have to ask. How exactly did this happen? There's a man that came to the house and started shooting. I don't know who he is. Okay, who did this? A man. He came in the house and started shooting. Okay. He has gray hair. He wore a ball cap, and he had a gray sweatshirt on. A blue gray shirt, a blue shirt, sweatshirt. Please help. Okay. We're shot, man. We're shot. I know. They're on their way for you, okay? They're on their way. Everybody's on their way for you, okay? We're going to stay on the phone. Okay? Okay. Vanessa, she's 19. She's pregnant. Okay. Is she okay? She's, she's crying. Did you shot, Vanessa? Well, three times. Okay. And, um, is your sister okay? Debbie. pregnant? No, she's shot. We're all shot. The man who came to the house and started okay. shooting. Please help, I'm bleeding. I know, they're on there. How many people are shot? There's three, there's four of us. Okay. Vanessa, stay calm, baby. Stay calm. The where did the person go when they left? Do you know what kind of vehicle they left in? No, man, we came to me shooting at me. I didn't even see him come inside the house. I was outside. And I heard Kitty inside crying. Okay, do you know where he went? No, ma'am, he shot me and left. I'm sitting on the ground. Okay. And praise the Lord. Please hurry. Okay. I school there's burning and there's a lot of blood coming out of it. Okay. I don't know what to do. Okay. We're, we're, we're together here, okay? You're not alone. Okay? Okay. I feel a lot of blood coming out of my shoulder. Okay. Is there anyone that has like a towel or maybe a shirt? No, yeah, okay. we're all shot. None of us can move. I see Debbie. Okay, where's your, where's your sister shot so we can know exactly how to help all of you? We're well, in the back of the house and there's Kitty that's inside the house. She's my boss. She's inside the house. Okay, and are you sure the guy's gone? I don't know. Oh. I'm sorry, I don't need to yell, but I'm bleeding and I hurt and that, that, that's okay. My son, my husband, my husband wants to go pick up my son from school. Oh, God. Okay. They don't even know I'm shot yet. They don't even know I'm hurt. I know. I know. You said there's four people that shot. Would you know where? Like, let's say, tell me where each person is shot. No, I don't know where they're shot. I see Debbie. She's laying by the screen door. Okay. Is she shot, too? Yes, we're all shot, man. I know. I know. I know. I know. Uh, do you know exactly where? <laughs> Ma'am? 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 The lights and sirens, they are trying to get to you as fast as they can. Okay? Are you sure you know where I'm at? 
You say you're at the back of, okay, that, that's where they're going, okay? And they're where the St. Right Petersburg right. Times is. St. Petersburg Times is right there on the corner of 50. And the Western Drive and yeah. come on. Yeah, we have it. I'm not we feeling good right now. We have it. We know exactly where you are, okay? I'm not feeling good right now. Please help. Okay, we're, we're, that's why we're going to stay on the phone together, okay? I feel like I'm getting sleepy. The, the, you feel like you're, they're, they're, they're trying to get there as fast as they can. They're all going lights and sirens, okay? We have fire rescue. We have deputies all trying to get there as fast as they can. I can't believe this guy came in and shot us. I don't know who he is. I just started working here last week. Okay, were you working at the house? It, it, you, you work at yeah, the house? Yeah, it's out of our house. It's out of our house. It's called, it's called Fly Art. Okay. It's like a, a color analyst. So I hear Debbie so that she's trying to breathe on her own and I can't help her. Okay. Well, they're all on their way for you, okay? I hear them. I hear them, Vanessa. Vanessa, I hear them. Yeah, let them know that they're on their way. They're all coming lights and sirens for you. So I know you're going to hear... Lots of lights and sirens. They're all coming your way, and they're coming for you at the back of the house. Help! Help! I can't believe this happened. Why don't I hear them anymore? They're there. They're, they're I don't want to die. They're all coming, okay? I'm going to die. No. No. We're going to stay on together, okay? They're all coming for you, and they are trying to get there as fast as they can. They're coming, Vanessa. They're coming, sweetheart. Oh, oh, come on, ladies. I told them again. Tell them to hurry. But they're, they're coming like in sirens. They're, they really no, they're not. They can't. They're it, I know it feels like a long time because of your situation. I know that it feels like a long time. But they, they really are trying to come as fast as they can. Are you sure they're coming? Yeah, I'm, I'm, Help! 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 Oh my God! I'm shot in the stomach and the shoulder. Help, please! We're here. We're shot twice. There's other people. They're on their way, okay? They're on their way. There's a girl. There's a lady in the house. In the mid-afternoon of January 14th, 2010, the women were finishing their work at the color analysis business at Donovan's in Brooksville, Florida home. Employee Amy Wilson, who goes by Amy Green, was cleaning up the backyard shed. Catherine's 18-year-old daughter, Manessa Donovan, was petting her horse, and the office manager, Deborah Buckley Tillotson, was smoking a cigarette. Manessa heard her mother yell, what the hell are you doing here? From inside the house, followed by three gunshots. She and Tillotson then moved towards the sliding door that was closed at the time to check on Kitty. She saw her uncle, John Kalish, standing directly in front of that door and her mother lying against it. Meanwhile, the office manager was standing right behind her. The teen blacked out for a second, saying, The next thing I remember is my uncle standing right in front of me holding the gun in my face. He did not say a word, and neither did I. He just stared at me for a moment. Kalish then shot at her once, sending her falling to the ground where he proceeded to shoot three or four more times. Manessa decided it was safest to pretend she was dead, but she saw the shooter walking towards Amy Wilson when she opened her eyes again. Wilson was pleading for her life, begging the man not to kill her. Despite this, he shot her multiple times, including in the stomach. Once Kalish turned his attention elsewhere, she made the 911 call. The employee, who only started working for Catherine Donovan a mere week before, said an unknown man burst into the Florida house and started shooting everyone in sight. It would later be confirmed that the man responsible for the shootings was Donovan's younger brother, John Kalish, and the uncle of the 18-year-old pregnant woman, Manessa Donovan. He then got into his van and fled the scene, where his murderous rampage continued after he got into a shootout with police, killing Dixie County Deputy Chad Reed. Here he was finally apprehended and charged. Kalish had a shaky relationship with his sister, Catherine, nicknamed Kitty, blaming her for all of his woes. In October 2009, a few months before the shooting, he received a six-year suspended jail sentence for exposing himself and masturbating in front of Kitty's daughter, Manessa, who was just 17 years old at the time. The accused blamed Kitty for forcing him to spend his entire inheritance received from his mother on legal fees. And just three months later, he exacted his revenge on his sister and his niece. 
On top of his disdain for his sister and her daughter, Kalish's mobile home was destroyed in a fire two days before this planned attack when he tried to change the propane tank. This may just have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Catherine Donovan died on the scene. 59-year-old Deborah Buckley Tillotson was also fatally shot four times. His niece, Manessa, who was pregnant at the time, did not escape his wrath when he shot her three times. And while she survived the attack, sadly, her baby did not. In the witness testimony, the killer's niece said she could not determine if Kalish had been drinking that day. However, she said Kalish did recognize her very well, saying that the shooter looked like he was possessed by a demon. Amy Wilson told the court that medical personnel could not remove the bullet from her neck as the procedure might cause paralysis. She is still in pain and unable to work as a result of her injuries. Kalish would later tell investigators that he walked into his sister's home that day and fired until the bullets ran out, referring to the shootings as an operation intended to erase his sister's bloodline. Two years later, in 2012, the court found John Kalish guilty of two counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of burglary with a firearm. He was tried and convicted separately for the killing of the Dixie County deputy. The jury unanimously recommended the death penalty, making John Kalish the first Hernando County convict to be sent to death row since 1994. Sadly, the families of Catherine Donovan, Deborah Tillotson, and Dixie County Deputy Chad Reed would never see the killer pay for his murderous rampage. He died less than three years after being sentenced in 2015, reportedly of natural causes. In August 2014, Panicked parents called 911 to report a child abduction at a Washington park. What they didn't know was that the little boy's family members staged the kidnapping. 911, where's your emergency? Somebody just came, just came, we're at it on Terry Blake Park, and somebody just pulled up in a van and stole a kid off a bench and drove off. Terry Blake Park? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and what type of vehicle was he in? It was a, it was a Dodge Caravan. It was silver. I'm like shaking right now. Where did they go? There. Oh my god. What? Where did they go? Um, I don't know. They just pulled out of the park. Oh my kid was. Okay. <sighs> Do you have a license plate for the car? No, I didn't. It would just happen really fast. <laughs> okay. And they were wearing a mask. Yeah, he was wearing a mask. Oh my god. <sighs> Can you describe what else he was wearing? He was wearing a black coat and black black skinny jeans and tennis shoes. Where in the park are you? Um, we're in the I don't know. Where we're in the park are we right now? We're in the, where the big kid toys is. Big kid toys. Yeah, we're in the big kid toys. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like we're getting a couple of calls about this. Are you the mom? Uh, well, no, I was just watching the little boy. The mom was in the bathroom. Okay, so the mom was in the bathroom. And he just jumped out. Yeah, the mom was in the bathroom. I was sitting right by the bench, and they just pulled up and stopped. And, like, my son was sitting on the bench next to him, and he just yanked the kid away and took off. What's your name? Laying in the grass right in front of him. I'm Cassie. What kind of ass was he wearing? Cassie, what's your last name? Okay, I have your phone number is 207. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So he was laying in the grass by the bench, and that's when he was taken. Yeah, I was laying, I was laying in the grass by the bench, and um, my, my son and the little boy were sitting on the bench right in front of us, and they just pulled up, and he jumped out of the van and grabbed the little boy and took off. Did you see anybody else? In the car with him? No. Did it have tinted windows? Driving. So there was a driver? I think that, that yeah, they had they, they two sliding doors and windows were all tinted except for the driver window. Oh my god. I Did you see any bumper stickers in the car? I, it happened so fast, I don't know. It was like a fuzzy, like. He was wearing a, he was wearing a fuzzy mask. It was a white, hairy, fuzzy mask. With um, it looked like a gorilla mask, but the eyes were painted blue and the mouth was red. Oh, I guess they staged it. it? I, I don't know for sure, but I'm the mother, and we staged it to see if people, what how people would react. 
and that we'd already called the police. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. What the hell? Okay, is there a car back? This is not if this is another or not. I don't know. So is it, it's police They're calling, yeah. There's that van right there, yeah. Van is returned. Okay, Kathy. Returned and she was in the van. The mother is in the van, too? Are you kidding me? That's not funny. Not funny. That just scared the shit out of us. Yeah, everything's fine. Okay, thank you for calling, Cassie. I have the information. Okay, will you, if we need to get a, car, a hold of you, we will. Not funny, especially with my kids. That's just no way. Ma'am? If your kid was sitting right here and, you just, and I asked you to watch, no. No, I don't care. I don't, this is wrong. I don't want where's your emergency? Okay. Okay. What's your name? My name is number bystander. Okay, Rebecca. What's your phone number? Okay. Is there someone feel, uh, filming that? Nobody's filming it. Okay. How do you spell your last name? Silver Van. Okay. The mother's trying to call in. Okay. Get the Amber Alert out. Oh, what's your last name? Okay. I can't understand if you're yelling. It's a silver van. Where is it in the parking lot? It went out of Cherry Blake Park and it turned north to one. Oh, my God. It's okay. Where? Where? Where in the park are you? Hi, we're at Cherry Blake Park. We already called the police and let them know that we were doing research projects to see um, how people would react in this situation. Okay. And what is your name? My name is Shelly. Okay. We'll go ahead and look. Okay. I will called in by Jason Holden, so. Okay. I'll let him know. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Hello. 911. I'm sorry, but talk to somebody who's in a crazy atmosphere and kidnapped a kid, and he took off with them. I'm not joking. The okay, we're, okay ma'am, ma'am, slow down. Yes. We're getting a lot of these calls. There's a person down there filming this. There is? Yes, this is supposed to be some kind of a setup deal. Hang on just a moment. The mom just said they didn't know. Okay. Did she know them or not? Oh, oh did they do? I'm sorry. Get the hell out of me. Okay, never mind then. Okay, bye-bye. That's right, bye. The child's mother was at a squim park with her four-year-old son and asked two men to watch him while she went to the bathroom. Then, two masked men in a minivan pulled up, and one man jumped out, grabbed a toddler, and took off. One of the masked men was the toddler's relative, and the mother was in on it. They later returned and explained the incident was recorded to create a video for social media on child abduction and prevention awareness. The fake kidnappers have a YouTube channel that posts videos of them performing pranks. 24-year-olds Jason and his cousin Jesse Holden said they had coordinated the hoax with his 33-year-old stepmother who allowed them to kidnap her son. Although the people behind the prank did call the police to inform them of it three to four minutes before they put their plan into effect, Squim Police Chief Bill Dickinson said it was in no way approved. Communications, this is Kyle. Yeah, we're doing a, um, like a kidnapping awareness video for, uh, for YouTube. And we're going to be doing it at, a, at the park. We're going to try to let as many people know as possible, so so like you know people don't get you know upset and call the cops or whatever. But we just kind of wanted to call in and let let you guys know in case there, like a phone call came in. Which whatever. park are you going to be at? At Carrie Blake Park. And we're um, we're using my uh, uncle's fiance's kid, and she's here and stuff too. So okay, what's your name? My name is Jesse. And your last name, Jesse. Holden. H-O-L-D-E-N? Yeah. And a good contact number for you? It's, uh, four. And when are you going to be starting and finishing? Uh, pretty soon. And it won't, we're going to be starting it here pretty soon, but it's not going to take long. It, it'll, um, I don't know, maybe like half hour or something. Okay, we'll go ahead and let the officers know. Okay, thanks. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye-bye. 
Jason Holden and the child's mother, Shelly Baskins, were arraigned in Clallam County District Court, where they pleaded not guilty to disorderly conduct charges. Jesse Holden was scheduled to be arraigned, but the hearing was postponed to allow him time to find another lawyer. The three could face nearly a year in jail or a $5,000 fine if convicted. The pair took to Good Morning America to apologize shortly after the incident. just want to start by making an apology to, uh, to everybody that was there and um, especially everyone that, you know, with their kids there and everything. We really didn't, we really didn't picture it having that kind of an impact. It's, it's kind of hard for me to watch it. I, I, I feel a lot of shame when I watch it. I really want to get my point across that we didn't do this as like a prank video. The trial's outcome was not posted online, but their YouTube channel no longer exists. Instead, the pair post prank videos on Facebook and have seemingly started a different YouTube channel. Where is three-year-old Aaliyah Lunsford? That's the question police, the FBI, and 1,800 volunteer searchers are trying to answer. Three-year-old Aaliyah Lunsford was last seen in bed by her mother and her nine-year-old sister around 6.30 a.m. The night before, she had been sick with flu-like symptoms, including vomiting. The next time her mother checked, at 9 a.m., she was gone.
maybe a little more. Okay. Is he how tall she is? Uh, um, I'm guessing around three feet. I'm, I'm not for sure right now. I'm sorry. That's okay. Was there anybody else in the residence with you this morning? Any other adults? No. The other children are in the residence? I have five kids. Okay, so there's four others in the residence? But there's three right now. Okay. When, where is the other one? My son is a visitation with his father. Okay. So you got up at 6.30 this morning with her, and she yes. was sick. Yes. And she, you, she went back to bed and went back to sleep, and then you laid down also? Yes. How old are your other children that are? Okay. Um, did any of them see her this morning? What time did they get up? They came in here. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe around 7, 7.30. came in here in my room with me. Okay, you said 11-year-old and 9-year-old and yes. 8 months? Yes. Okay, can you look outside and see the officer? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yes, I see one out here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let you off the line so you can go talk to him. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, bye. Lena Lunsford made the call at 11.30, five hours after the toddler was last seen. When officers arrived at the West Virginia home on September 24, 2011, there were no indications of forced entry, and the family said Aaliyah wouldn't have left alone, given her shy nature. An extensive search was launched. The police brought in divers who searched the river after canines led them to footprints directly behind the home. At the time, the children's grandmother, Joanne Evans, had custody of them, but Lena had been given visitation rights over the weekends. She never leaves the house unless an adult is with her. She wouldn't have, she wouldn't have came out in the yard or the road, for that matter, without her mother. They are doing everything that they possibly can, but the more people we can get to help, the better chances of breaking out. Although suspicions mounted against Aaliyah's mother, she was about eight months pregnant with twins at the time, so it seemed impossible for her to have carried a body out on her own. In the aftermath of Aaliyah's disappearance, her four siblings were taken from the household and placed in foster care. Sadly, their grandmother, Joanne, died shortly after the three-year-old went missing. Lena was arrested for welfare fraud a month later, marking the beginning of her legal troubles. She and her ex-husband, Ralph Keith Lunsford, had a history of minor criminal offenses and had been accused of neglecting their children. Lena lost her parental rights to her six children while in jail in February 2013. Multiple incarcerations followed this due to probation violations tied to her welfare fraud conviction. She was jailed three times within five years of Aaliyah's disappearance. Finally, there was a break in 2016 after Lunsford's two daughters, who were 9 and 11 at the time, came forward to the police. They'd been keeping a secret and were ready to tell their story about what happened to Aaliyah. Their mother had taken the little girl's life. Lena was arrested and charged with homicide by child abuse. As the news of Lena Lunsford became public, a neighbor told reporters that it was no surprise. It doesn't shock me. We've always, a, a lot of people have always felt that that's where the answer, you know, did lay with this whole mystery. I hope that, you know, we do get some resolution to it. I certainly feel like after this many years, it does need to be reconciled. Aaliyah's sister, Destiny, spoke about the night she had played back for years in a Fox 11 Eyewitness News interview. I was doing something in a different room and I heard commotion, so I like ran to see what was going on. And I did witness um, our mom take a board to her head and she fell. You know, she wasn't allowed to wear any clothes and her beds were stripped full of sheets and so it had the regular plastic bed and um, she went to sleep. We felt her head before she went to sleep and it was like squishy like I had said. Um, and she said that her head hurt really bad. And when nothing really worked, um, we um, took Aaliyah out to bait us in a hamper and um, we left her there. She started cleaning up around like the areas and everything and we called the police and we got her story straight and everything. Even though it has been five years since the horrifying murder and previous evidence photos taken by police, Destiny could point out the board that her mother had hit Aaliyah with, as well as the hamper Lena used to carry her daughter's body into the woods. However, 
Lena's other daughter, Kira, was unaware that Destiny had told police the truth, so law enforcement bugged the house to allow the sisters to have the conversation. The girl's foster parents knew that Kira's testimony was crucial to the investigation. In fact, they were even texting Destiny about what to say to help. Miraculously, after three hours and just before the batteries ran out, the sisters started talking about that night. They would have to testify again at Lena's trial. Also taking the stand was her ex-husband, Ralph. The couple had divorced shortly after the toddler went missing. He admitted to using bath salts the night of Aaliyah's disappearance and claimed ignorance about what happened to the child. A co-worker confirmed Ralph's alibi, and he was cleared of all suspicion. All three witnesses painted a devastating picture of the relationship between Aaliyah and her mother. Her sisters detailed how terribly the little girl was treated, while Ralph told the court that many of his arguments with Lena revolved around her treatment of Aaliyah. He would spend time at his house in Vadis when Lena kicked him out. In light of the allegations, Aaliyah's aunt, Wendy Swiger, said it really hurt to think the toddler's mother had anything to do with it. Lena is not my sister. In April 2018, Lena was convicted on all counts, including murder of a child, child abuse resulting in injury, and concealment of a deceased human body. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole, plus an additional 40 years for the other charges. Despite the conviction, Aaliyah's body has never been found. Authorities suspect her remains might be in a frequently flooded ravine, leaving no trace behind. The family has never stopped looking. What had started as a fun night ended in a way that party host Tyson Bishop would never have imagined. Tyson and his sister, Kirby Bishop, were throwing a Halloween party which got a little loud. A neighbor called police twice to complain about the noise, but by the time police got there at around 3 a.m., the party had died down to just Tyson and his sister and four friends hanging out in an upstairs bedroom. The two responding officers got no reply when they knocked on the front door and entered the property without permission or a warrant. They went upstairs and ordered those who didn't live there to go home. As the guests scrambled to get out, Kirby knocked into one of the officers. The officer considered that an assault and he and his partner pinned Kirby to the bathroom floor and detained her. During this, Constable Gilbert hit Kirby in the face, which her brother Tyson saw and tried to protect his sister. The police officer then tasered Tyson Bishop in the face. Tyson Bishop was also punched twice by Gilbert. The siblings were taken to hospital for their injuries to be treated, but they were then charged for assaulting and obstructing the police. Tyson and Kirby Bishop filed a complaint against the police and waited years for the response. In 2012, the Nova Scotia Police Review Board ruled that the officers didn't have the reasonable grounds to enter the home, order the guests to leave, or have the authority to make the arrests. They also determined that the officer overreacted and should have been in better control of the situation. After considering all the circumstances, they decided that the officer who had punched Kirby and tasered and punched Tyson would keep his job but would be suspended for two weeks without pay and be under close supervision for one year. He was ordered to be assessed for anger management and take counseling for that if needed. Tyson and Kirby Bishop incurred bills of 66,000 Canadian dollars for the damage, medical fees, and legal fees from the assault, but were awarded only 1,000 Canadian dollars by the review board.
15-year-old Petra Davis was participating in a 24-hour bike marathon event in July 2008 when she was attacked by a bear. The event was outside Anchorage, Alaska. Another participant, Pete Basinger, stopped on the secluded trail, dialed 911 and gave directions, took medical advice, and comforted Davis for 23 minutes until paramedics arrived. Hello? Hi, this is Anchorage Police. Um, so, uh, we, I, I have a bear mauling. I am out on the trail. Um, I just reported it to somebody else who's going to be calling 911. Um, I have a young girl here who is mauled by a bear. And it's in uh, pretty bad shape, so we need paramedics. Okay. I'm going to transfer you through to the medics, or did you guys already talk to the medics? I have not talked to anybody yet. Okay. Where are you guys? Okay. To access us, the easiest access would be to go to the hilltop ski area and go down what is called the gas line trail to where it meets Campbell Creek. There is a, a trail. So you're closest to hilltop? Hilltop ski area, yes. In, in Into the actual ski area. There is a trail... You can, you can okay. drive all Hold on time. one second. Okay, now that I've got kind of where you are, I need to transfer you through to the medics, okay? okay. Hold okay. on. Thank you. Fine, I know you will be. Just, just, you just gotta wait. You said you haven't. Yeah, hello? Okay, hold on one second. Fire paramedics, what's the location of the emergency? Uh, okay, you want the location of the emergency? Yes. It is on what is called Rover's Run Trail, and the best way to access that is by the gas line trail, which begins... Okay. what's the problem? Tell me exactly what happened. Okay, um, I just came across a, a young girl who was mauled by a bear. She All right. is... I'm going to ask you some questions about her while my partner gets help started. We, we do have calls on this. I just need to get some better patient information. How okay. old is she? Um, I believe she's about 16, 15, 16 years old. All right. I'm okay. just confirming. Is she conscious? She is conscious. Is she's she breathing? She is breathing heavily, yes. Just a couple more questions for her while my partner gets help started. Hold on one second. What, what what, when what, did this happen? Um, I would say within the last probably 15 to 20 minutes All right. would probably be accurate. Is there any serious bleeding? Yeah, severe bleeding. All right. Are you with her right now? I am, and we're, we're in close proximity to where it happened. Which is what kind of me, injuries does she have? Um, it, it's hard to tell because it's dark enough, and I dropped my bike All right. down the trail. I don't have a light. All right. Is there any animal? Is the attacker or is the animal still nearby? Um, not that I know of. I, I, I hope it's gone away, but you're doing good, Pedro. You're doing awesome. You're just fine. You're really fine. It's, it's scary, but that's all it is, okay? All right. Does she have any serious bleeding? Um, yes, I would okay, say Okay, what that. I want you to do is get a clean, dry cloth or towel, place it on the wound, press it down firmly, and do not lift it up to look. Um, I, I don't know exactly where the wound is, is the problem. All right. Can you ask her where she thinks she's hurt? Yeah, bear. There went bear. Is the bear there? Um, not that I know of, but you know, there's a lot. I hear you. I hear you. Do you know what kind of bear it was? Uh, I, I don't. No. Hey, Joe, you're doing so good. You're doing awesome. Just, just relax. Okay, hey, Joe, still there? Okay, okay. I just, I want you to stay awake. Is she, is she breathing regularly? Um, yeah, but, but I, I would, I would say heavy breathing. She, she, she's very much conscious, but, okay. you know, do you, you know you, where you, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can you hear anybody out there? Can you hear uh, no, you know, there's a good chance that someone will be through any time now because there's a there's a bike race, a twenty four hour race going on and uh bikers will be coming through but but it gets hey, if there's a bike if you see somebody pass by I want you to stop them and but I'll have them go up and, and flag them meet, yeah. And, yeah. I the light is on on my bike. Um if they look down the once they kinda make the turn into the trail they'll both we'll kinda see it. Hey, can you stop please? Who is that? Okay. We have uh, well she was attacked by a bear. Um, we have the paramedics coming, but this is the issue. They're going to be coming in through the South Bivouac Trailhead. Can you go up there and direct them down? I want you to yell and be as careful as you can because the bears obviously still in the proximity. Just, just, you got it. There's like four more coming. Okay, okay. Just make a lot of noise. Pedro, you're doing awesome. You're doing so good. Still there? Can you not? Okay, okay, awesome. We're letting them know right now that we're sending, that you're sending somebody down. Yep, I'm, 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 he's going to go right up to the south of the black trailhead, and he'll direct him down. 
It's it's a little bit of a hike down, but it's not it's not that big of a deal. Okay. How's she doing? Um, she seems to be doing extremely well. It's you know, um, she, she's still she's still conscious. She she can move a little bit. All right. Um, can you tell got, now where the bleeding's coming from? Okay, so you don't know where you got hurt. Do you? Okay. No, we just it, uh, yeah, it's it's crazy, but I, I just can't tell. It, okay. it looks like she might have got rolled around in the dirt quite a bit by the bear. So. Okay. Let me know where coming for her. Here, Pedro, hold my hand, okay? Just hold it right here. Okay. You're doing awesome. You're going to be fine if you just hang in there. A couple minutes, you'll be getting cleaned up. It's feeling way better. So tell me if you, tell me if you start to hurt more. Something happens, okay? Can, can you see? Are you looking ahead? Okay, okay. Just, just keep relaxing. We don't want her to move around unless she's in danger. Okay, okay. Don't, we don't yeah. splint any injuries. Yeah, I, I, I moved her, I moved us about 50 feet from where the attack was, cause okay. I just, yeah, I figured that was probably constituted as danger, but you know, I don't know. Oh, don't move, don't move if you don't have to, please. I think someone's, someone's gonna be here any minute now. Do we, uh, do we have any word on if they found the trail yet? They're on location, they're responding on location right now, they're, they're looking for the trail. Okay, we've got another, it's coming. Hey, can you stop? Is that another biker? Yeah, can you come here, please? Who is that? Okay, can you hang with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a we have a bear attack. Um, so maybe if you can just hang out here. I sent Will up the up to the south of Black Shard. Okay. Okay, you're okay, Pedro. You're okay. So hey. help help me flag people in here. That's the that's our main concern. Hello, Will Ethan. Okay. There, I, it sounds like they might be coming. I'm not sure. Who do you see coming? Right here. Who's here? Okay. Are the paramedics coming? Yeah. Okay, okay, it sounds like they're on their Who way. Who are you talking to? Oh, um, a, a couple other bikers just showed up. Okay, so we don't know where the bleeding's coming from. We're just going to hold her in place. Who did they talk to, though? Who are the two bikers talking to, though, that came up? Oh, are you paramedics? Okay. Uh, is that the paramedics that are on location right now? Yeah, we have the EMT here right now. No, there's an Anchorage Fire Department EMT. Are you fire department? Uh, no. Oh, okay, so when they said they had paramedics, they meant the paramedics. Is somebody there at the trailhead? Can they confirm that? That somebody's up at the trailhead to meet us? I, I can't confirm that. Well, we're concerned okay, about it. Gonna... Okay, hold on just a moment here. I'm sorry. Uh, so the trail that you're on, this is what I need to know. The trail that you're on is not accessible by a vehicle. Is that correct or not? It, yes, that, that is correct. They okay. don't, need, don't need a board. It's a, it's a foot trail only. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, so they need to come down the South Bivouac go across the footbridge, and then take a right and go down the trail that, that parallels Campbell Creek. Yep, yeah. And, and that's there, called Rover Trail. Uh, yeah, it's called Run Rover Trail. Okay. And, uh, and there, um, there's, a, there's a gentleman that's up there to kind of flag him in. So. Okay. Well, I'm thinking that he already met them. They should be on their way in there shortly. Okay, okay, good. We're going to keep, you, keep you on the phone till, till they, yeah, till yeah. we I'll, get there. Yeah, yeah, I'll stay on the phone. We, we right. do have an EMC on the scene, so... Um, and we, we've got a couple people here now, so. How's she doing? She, she's doing great. She, okay. she, she's, uh, her breathing is, her breathing slowed down a little bit, and it's, it's just because she's calming down. All right. Um, Do you still have a clean, dry cloth? Uh, can, you, I, can you still, can you find out where the bleeding is from now? I mean, since she's calmed down a little bit, can you ask her where she thinks she got bit? She, I've asked her three times. She still doesn't know. Um, we have an EMT, and he is, he's starting to kind of, uh, you know, take off some clothing and, and do, do searching, so. Um, All right. Well, let me, if they find anything, just let me know. Okay. It looks like it, it may, um, just, just looking, it looks like a puncture wound to the face, um, and I think that may be where a lot of the blood is from. Okay. Um, a little bit of left eye trauma. Um, it looks like a, a puncture wound or a little trauma to the inner thigh, um, but it's not bleeding. It, it just doesn't look like it's, it, like, hit an artery or anything. Okay. This is APD. Do you know what type of bear it is? Do I know what type? Uh, you know, we, we still, um, you know, it, it's dark, so I seriously doubt that um, doubt that she was able to identify what type of bear it was. Okay. Because you're doing so good. Just relax. You're in good hands. The medics have met somebody on top of the road, and they're on their way down. Okay. Okay, Pedro, the medics have met Will up at the top of the road. They're going to be down here. Oh, okay, okay. And I, I think I mentioned that there is a puncture wound to the inner thigh. Yes, you have. Um, 
and also one kind of on the uh, quadricep, uh, or like above the knee. It looks like a, kind of a similar wound. Okay, yeah, she's starting to have a little trouble bleeding. Uh, breathing. Okay. Um, Is it just because I, she's in pain, or I think there may she's got a lot of pressure right on my leg there. I, I just I, I wonder if that's going to hurt her rib. Yeah, we, I, I think we don't want her moving. Keep her in the okay. same position that she's in. Okay, we, we had to move her on her side. Uh, um, she or she kind of has rolled over on her side. Um, there, there seems to be a little bit of a puncture wound, maybe in the in the throat area. I think she's starting to struggle to breathe a little bit at the moment. All right, let me know if anything changes with her. Okay, she she's breathing um, more rapidly now. Okay. Well, As we've moved on. Just pretty sure that we have help on the way for her, uh, and that the medics are coming. Major, I I know it hurts. Just relax. The medics are on their way. You're, you're they're they're going to be here in, in just seconds. Just relax. And sir, we've got officers escorting the medics in right now. Okay, okay. They have some uh, police coming in with the medics because they're concerned about the bear in the area. Can I get your name, sir? Uh, my name is Keith Dassinger. All right, thank you. Um, we also just located a kind of a a, a wound, um, located wound, um, kind of a, lar a rather large, I would say probably three inches long. Um, it's I'm just com confirming that... The people that are helping her, they have a clean, dry cloth on these wounds. Um, and they're applying pressure and are not lifting it up to look. Uh, well, the, the EMT is, uh, is, is rinsing the wound. They don't seem to be bleeding that bad. Um, it's right. the fa facial wound that seems to be bleeding. Okay. Um, but but uh, just to let you know, there, there is a wound in her back, um, kind of above her left um, butt cheek. Um, it's probably about three inches long, you know, it kind of into the meaty area there. It's, it's not bleeding that bad, but it is, you know, a little bit dirty. So. Okay. You're an awesome page. Just keep relaxing. We're going to get you all fixed up here. Okay. It looks, uh, is that medics? Uh, the medics have arrived. We have right. a... They're with her? Uh, okay, excuse me? Uh, is that the ASD medics? Uh, we have a... Uh, yeah, we have a... Um, uh, a fire department medic. And are the police with them too? Um, yeah, the police are here with guns and everything. So okay. I'm going to let you go so you can talk to them. Thank you for calling for Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. The team was an accomplished biker, cross-country skier, and runner. She was 13 hours into a 24-hour trail bike race in far north by Centennial Park when a bear, presumed to be a grizzly, attacked Davis. Thankfully, Pete Basinger, her longtime friend and coach, was the first rider to find Davis after the attack. Basinger was also participating in the race. He told the Today Show that the 15-year-old was bloodied and didn't know who she was. The coach also spoke to CBS 11. I picked her up and carried her down the trail, and um, she had a cell phone in her hand and, and gave it to me, kind of shoved it into me. It was only after this that Basinger realized who the victim was. The bear punctured a lung, broke eight ribs, mauled her right leg, and nicked her carotid artery, leaving her a bloody heap in the trail. Despite her injuries, Davis could still call 911 on her cell phone before Basinger arrived. On the tape of the call, her voice is a gasping and desperate whisper. Basinger then called 911 twice more but was unable to get a connection. He then called the race director who called for help. It took rescuers, escorted by armed police against the possibility of another attack, more than half an hour to get to the pair. Another few minutes and she would have bled to death from the damaged carotid artery. Yet remarkably, Davis was still conscious, initially not feeling any pain at all. The 15-year-old underwent several surgeries in the days after the attack and spent 20 days in the hospital. Just three months after the attack, Davis told an interviewer that although she was still undergoing physical therapy and had scars on her back, side, and right leg, she was almost 100% back. The race was later moved from the park. In 2019, the Alaska Huts Association hosted an annual women's mountain biking clinic in the heart of Kenai Mountains. In a video from the event, Davis shared her story. I got mauled by a bear about 11 years ago. Did you really? I did. Yeah, wouldn't it be funny if I was like, no, I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> All the stories that I've told are false. After the joking start, the brave woman retold how the attack unfolded in the aftermath of it. I'm really fortunate to have a pretty, pretty miraculous recovery. I recovered a lot faster than a lot of people thought. I'm really fortunate that I don't remember much of the incident. And I went to therapy for a little bit, but not much. 
And I still love mountain biking, and I've never had this big comeback that like, I remember everything, and I can't get out and ride. Petra Davis still doesn't like riding at night, but she rode the Kanai 250 on the 10th anniversary of the attack. On the evening of February 26, 2014, Kathy Carpenter, a bank teller and close friend of well-known Aspen socialite Nancy Pfister, was concerned when Pfister had not returned her phone call from two days earlier. When Carpenter found out that her friend had not shown up for her job for two days, she decided to drive to Fister's secluded log home in rural Buttermilk, Colorado. The woman made her way around the home, looking for the missing woman. Carpenter noticed the bed in disarray, the comforter draped over the side, and the sheets pulled off one side of the mattress. As she drew closer, she noticed a tiny stain of blood spattered on the bed frame. The walk-in closet was locked, so she went home to get the key. Inside lay Nancy Fister's lifeless body. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. 911, what is the address of the emergency? Oh my god. Oh my god. What is the address of the emergency? Oh. Is that a house, business, or apartment? It's a house. It's Nancy Fister's house. My, my bed. Uh, Ma'am, tell me exactly what happened. Oh, okay. My, my bed had... Oh, I got my bed in the closet. <laughs> Ma'am, tell me exactly what happened. My, my friend came back from Australia, said she just stood had some people living there. She really pissed them off. And... Um, he made threats to them about owing money, and I don't know. He, I couldn't find her. She didn't call, and these people said the dog had been in the house, and she hasn't been around. So I went up there to get the dog, and I was looking for her. I need you to tell me exactly what happened. I, I can't. My friend is in her closet, yes. In her closet? Yes. Okay, stay on the line with me. We're going to send help that way. The small town socialite was the daughter of two well-known parents. Her father, Art Fister, made a fortune when he turned his family cattle ranch into the Buttermilk Ski Resort. Her mother, Betty Haas Fister, was a Women Air Force Service Pilots member in World War II. In later years, she flew a helicopter, which she was notoriously known for parking in the family's driveway. When she was younger, Fister met John F. Kennedy, Jack Nicholson, Cher, and Michael Douglas when they vacationed at her parents' ski resort. She was briefly engaged to Michael Douglas. During the murder investigation, police immediately became suspicious when they received information that Fister had returned home early from a vacation a week before her murder. Kathy Carpenter told them that she had picked the woman up from the airport, driven her home, and was asked if she could stay at the house over the weekend by her friend. On Monday morning, Carpenter got up early and left for work, leaving Fister alone at the house. She left a note on the door for guests, saying that Fister was sleeping and to call her to see if she was awake enough to talk before entering the house. Another one of her friends, Billy Clayton, said that he did not want to bother Fister while she was sleeping, so he sent her an email, but she never replied. Leading up to her murder, she rented her house to retire Dr. Trey Styler and his wife Nancy as a way to help pay off her mortgage. Fister abruptly evicted the stylers from her house and refused to let the stylers collect their belongings from the home. However, things became even more strange on the Wednesday when the pair called Carpenter to tell her that they had recently moved out to a motel in Basalt, Colorado. The stylers said they were returning to the home just to clear out their belongings. By this point, nobody, including the roommates, had seen or heard from Fister since Monday morning. This would later draw suspicion from the police and Carpenter. At the time, Nancy Styler said the dog had been alone for a while since the dog's food and water dishes were empty. Investigators believed that Fister had been killed on Monday and left in the closet until Carpenter's gruesome discovery. On the flipped side of the mattress, where they believed the victim had been murdered, they found a large pool of blood. Based on where her body was placed, detectives also deduced that she had been attacked by two people who carried her body to the closet. Since there was no sign of forced entry, they started focusing on Trey and Nancy Styler. 
Additionally, they became aware of a monetary dispute between the trio. The Stylers paid Carpenter $6,000 since Fister was on vacation, which she kept in a safe deposit box. They said they would move out by February 22nd and weren't there, but their belongings were. The homeowner grew annoyed with the couple for not moving out fast enough and began locking the house during the day while she was at work. Police questioned the Stylers separately following the murder, and both denied any involvement. In fact, Trey Styler even took a polygraph test. He failed the test, which added to investigators' suspicions, but they didn't have enough to lay charges against the two. Authorities couldn't use DNA since they lived in the house. Police were contacted after a city worker discovered a bloody hammer, pill bottles with Nancy Fister's name printed on them, and a vehicle registration for Trey and Nancy Styler's Jaguar behind the motel where the Stylers were staying. On March 3, 2014, they were finally arrested when investigators discovered the owner's key to the closet, essentially the crime scene, outside the Stylers' hotel room. Carpenter was also arrested and charged with first-degree murder three weeks later after investigators thought she had helped the two commit the crime. This was based on multiple statements she made to detectives while describing items she had seen at the crime scene. Those items seemed impossible to have been observed. The autopsy report showed that the wounds to Fister's face were caused by someone beating her with a hammer. Since there were no defensive wounds, it seemed she was beaten while she was asleep. He determined that the cause of her death was due to blunt force trauma to the head and exsanguination. In her interview with the police, Nancy Styler called the victim a liar and an alcoholic, claiming the community hated the woman. She claimed Fister had called her and her husband trailer trash and said they should be living in a trailer park. The accused said the woman treated herself and Carpenter like a slave. Prosecutors used this to say the Stylers and Carpenter had motives to kill Fister. However, on June 12th, Trey Styler confessed to the authorities that the murder was all his idea and that he did it himself. This led to the release of his wife, Nancy Styler, and Kathy Carpenter, who had spent over three months in prison. Nancy's defense attorney, Beth Krulowicz, also said that the court did not have enough evidence to sentence her client. Trey was then sentenced to 20 years in prison on the count of second-degree murder. He, however, did not serve his complete sentence as he was found to have hung himself at the Arrowhead Correctional Center on August 6, 2015, after his wife filed for divorce upon leaving prison. Not satisfied with the ruling over her mother's case, Fister's daughter, Juliana Fister, later filed a lawsuit against Nancy Styler. The details of the lawsuit included that Nancy ripped a book deal and life insurance of $1 million off her mother's and Trey's death. In addition, it was also stated in the lawsuit that Trey could have gotten a false confession because he didn't want his wife to face jail time. Reconsidering the details concerning Fister's death, the victim had been hit on the head with a hammer and plunged in the chest with an axe. An extension cord was found around her neck. After she was confirmed dead, Fister was then wrapped inside a trash bag and locked in the bedroom closet. According to the argument presented by the lawsuit, Trey couldn't have acted alone because it would take more than one person to put a body inside a trash bag. Citing all these injustices, Piper's daughter, Juliana, wanted Nancy to pay for damages. Aspen attorney, David Bovino, explained, I truly don't believe Juliana is financially motivated at all. This is in memory of her mother to hold someone who she believes is responsible for her mother's murder. At the time of this video, it is unclear whether or not Juliana got compensated, but as her attorney said, there is no man of money in the world that will bring back Juliana's mother. The police department released a 911 call made from Wendy's parking lot where Rayshad Brooks got into an altercation with police officials and was later shot and killed. On the night of June 12, 2020, Officer Devin Brosnan responded to a complaint that Brooks was blocking a Wendy's restaurant drive through lane. Brosnan radioed Officer Garrett Rolf for assistance. All right, you need police, fire, ambulance out here. I'm the police. Okay, tell me what's going on. Um, I have a car. I think he's intoxicated. He's in the middle of my drive-thru. I tried to wake him up, but he, he's parked dead in the middle of the okay. drive-thru, so I don't know what's wrong with him. Is he breathing now? Do you know? 
Yeah, he woke up, looked at me, and I was like, you got to move out of the drive through because people can't, they're going around him. He's in the middle of the, just right All there. Right. Tell me what kind of car he's So they're trying to go around him. What's the and car I asked him to pull over. You know, if he not had too much to drink to pull over and go to sleep, he said he went, they said he went right back out by walking in. What kind of car is it? It's a white car. And just see that you can't miss me one is more. Is he black? <laughs> is he black? Why is he Yeah. He black. black. Okay, in a white sedan in the middle of the drive through No, let me see what kind of car it is. Right here. I, yeah, he is. He's right here. The car is going around him. Okay. All right. Does he appear to have any weapons, ma'am? Ma'am? Does he appear to have any weapons from where, where you can see him? No, no. I think he's intoxicated. The dispute between Brooks and the officers was caught on body cam footage. <laughs> Oh. Oh. What's up, my man? Hey. What's up, man? You good? You don't need a ambulance or anything like that? Are you just tired? All right, man. Just, just, I'll move my car. Just pull up. Just pull somewhere and take it out. All right. <laughs> I don't want to deal with this dude right now. Hey, how much did you drink tonight? Not much. How much is not much? Wow, Drake, like today. All right, hey, you have your license on you real quick? Yeah. All right. Just, just relax the car. What are you, uh, are you just, are you here for a visit or what's, uh? I'm visiting. Where are you visiting? Uh, my mother's grave site. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. How, how long has she, uh, passed for? It's, it's been probably about a year and a half now, but. Okay, I'm sorry to hear my that. My birthday's just passed and, uh. My girlfriend's birthday just yeah. passed, but I, I went to visit her and yeah. All right. we decided to eat Burger King tonight and hey, this happened. Right, I, said, I hear you. I say, babe, what's going on? Right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to we're gonna talk to this officer here for a minute and then uh, we'll be good to go, okay? Oh, no. No problem. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Stay in the car. Stay right there. Hey, what's going on? So, found him passed out in the... Line, he's sitting here. So he was in the drive. -thru. Yeah, he's, he's okay. on. Cars on. Took me like a few minutes to wake him up. Kept knocking. Opened the door. Like shook him. Woke up. Super groggy. Got you know pretty good smell of alcoholic beverage coming out of the car. Eyes are watery and glassy. Snorting his words. Wasn't really sure where he was. And uh, tell me he had one drink. He said earlier. Tell me I wasn't here. So can you tell me what uh, what That's happened it. before we got here? I can just go home. I have my daughters there right now. My three, my daughter's birthday was yesterday. All right. Hold on, Miss Brooks. Will you take a preliminary breath test for me? It's yes or no. I don't want to refuse anything. Uh, it's yes or no. It's completely up to you. Yes, I will. Okay, just wait here while I grab. I what need what kind eat. of drinks did you have? Uh, I'm not sure. It's some she ordered. She said top shelf or whatever. Top shelf what? I'm not sure. It was like I said. It was her birthday and. You had about one and a half drinks, but you don't remember what kind of drinks they were? No, sir. All right. I really don't, Mr. Roth. All right. I think you've had too much to drink to be driving. So put your hands behind your back for me. Yeah, put your hands behind your back. Hey, hey, stop fighting. Stop fighting. Stop fighting. Stop fighting. You're going to get tased. You're going to get tased. Stop. You're going to get tased. Stop. Stop. You're going to get tased. Hey, that's a Stop! Hands stop fighting! 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 Did he hit 
hit you with it? I I felt it, but I don't. Oh, hey, hey, kind of hey, hey. 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 If you're willing and able, I just, I don't need anything uh, specific at this juncture, because I know you're still evaluating it. Um, just give me the pure basics of how we round up here. I was called to do a DUI investigation. Okay, so there's only three officers already on site. Yeah. To develop probable cause to arrest the suspect for DUI. He resisted arrest and he gained control of the other officer's taser. And started running as I pursued him. He turned and started firing the taser at me. Okay. You're good, you alright? Yeah. Still got the adrenaline pumping. Uh, you alright? No, I'm okay. Alright, good, 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 good. Alright, we're gonna take care of you, brother. I'm just glad you're alright. That's my biggest concern. Yeah, we're good. Alright, good. You talk to your wife? You talk to your family, everybody? No, I hadn't called anybody other than the IPPO. Okay. Alright, hopefully you. we'll get this cleared up. Anything right. you need from me? Any Clear update on, the, on Mr. Brooks? Well, I ain't checked yet, so okay. we'll get that squared away, all right? All right. But you're good. A few minutes after he was shot, an ambulance arrived and took Brooks to the hospital, where he died following surgery. Brosnan was treated for a concussion. In less than 24 hours after the man was shot and killed, Atlanta's Police Department Chief Erica Shields resigned. Mayor Bottoms said Shields had resigned in the hope that the city may move forward with urgency and rebuild the trust so desperately needed throughout our communities. Chief Shields has offered to immediately step aside as police chief so that the city may move forward with urgency in rebuilding the trust so desperately needed throughout our communities. In the interim, Rodney Bryant, a 31-year-old Atlanta Police Department veteran, came out of retirement to serve as interim police chief. Rolf was fired, and Brosnan was placed on administrative duty. The Fulton County District Attorney, Paul Howard, announced 11 charges against Rolf, felony murder, five counts of aggravated assault, four police oath violations, and property damage. Brosnan was charged with aggravated assault and two counts of violation of oath. Howard argued that the taser that Brooks had taken posed no danger. After being fired twice, it could not be fired again. It was also a violation of department policy for Rolf to begin handcuffing Brooks before telling him he was being arrested. Additionally, Howard said that Rolf and Brosnan failed to provide timely medical aid to Brooks for over two minutes. Policy that requires that the officers have to provide timely medical attention to Mr. Brooks or to anyone who is injured. But after Mr. Brooks was shot, for some period of two minutes and 12 seconds, uh, there was no medical attention applied to Mr. Brooks. Uh, but when we examined the videotape and in our discussions with what we discovered is during the two minutes and 12 seconds that Officer Rolf actually kicked Mr. Brooks while he laid on the ground, they're fighting for his life. Secondly, from the videotape, we were able to see that the other officer, Officer Brosnan, actually stood on Mr. Brooks's shoulders while he was there struggling for his life. Um, we were able to conclude that based on the way that these officers conducted themselves, while Mr. Brooks was lying there, that the demeanor of the officers immediately after the shooting did not reflect any fear or danger of Mr. Brooks, but their actions really reflected other kinds of emotions. Brosnan was released on June 18th after posting a $50,000 signature bond in an interview. The accused said the interaction with Brooks started peacefully. I felt he was friendly, he was, he was respectful, uh, you know, I was respectful to him, um, you know, and I felt like, you know, he just seemed like someone who potentially needed my help, and I was really just there to see what I could do for him and make sure that he was safe. The following day after charges against Rolf was announced, Atlanta police officers called in sick for their shifts, staging a blue flu protest. In the four days from the 17th to the 12th, 
About 170 officers called in sick, and officers in the three out of the city's six police zones did not respond to calls. In an interview, Vince Champion, regional director of the International Brotherhood of Police Officers, said some officers are afraid to go to work and answer a call because they might face prosecution for doing their job. They think, you know, that this, this could be me and I could be doing my job and next thing I know I'm fired because the mayor doesn't like what she saw and then I'm facing murder charges because the DA didn't like what he saw. Atlanta Mayor Bottoms denounced this and called the blue flu protests stupid. Something stupid like that happens to basically tell officers to abandon their post, that is the height of dereliction of duty. Brooks's murder happened less than three weeks after George Floyd's death while in police custody. Floyd's death sparked nationwide protests against police brutality and racial injustice. The fatal shooting of another black man by the officers intensified the protests. Brooks became a potent symbol against police brutality. Protesters gathered at the shooting site beginning June 12 and set fire to Wendy's restaurant outside which Brooks was shot and several nearby cars and broke a television camera. Oh, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's tiring. It, fight, it, it hurts. It hurts. But listen, man, we have to build, we have to build this nation all over again. Rapper T.I. joined protesters on the streets of Georgia over the weekend to demand justice for Brooks. I know we do a lot of talking about what separates us. I know we do a lot of talking about how far we have to go, but let's talk about what we've done. Let's talk about what we've done in such a short period of time. We have forced them to acknowledge the pain that has existed for years and years. We have forced them to take into account and consider what we've gone through ever since they brought us to this country. We have forced them to now be considerate of our, our lives, our liberties, and we can't let up off the gas. Now, I have a phrase, it's us or else. But I wanna to explain to you what that or else means. I'ma just tell you, I care, that's why I'm here. I'm not a politician. I don't run no office. I don't do None of the stuff that politicians do. I care, that's why I'm here. Amen. That's why I was at that press conference. That's why Killer Mike was at that press conference. Because we care. This is about us, and I feel like us together, united, yes, sir. Yes, sir. is better than the strongest of us, that's separated right. and apart. That's right. Those that knew Brooks remembered him as a caring father and an enthusiastic dancer. Before his death, Rashad Brooks focused on getting his life back on track after spending two years in prison. I just feel like some of the system could, you know, look at us as individuals. We do have lives, you know, we're, it's just a mistake we made, you know, and, you know, not, not just do us as if we are animals. At his funeral, the Reverend Dr. Raphael G. Warnock said Brooks wasn't just running away from the police. He was running away from a system that makes slaves out of people. The Reverend continued to say that this is much bigger than the police. This is about a whole system that cries out for renewal and reform. On July 6, police and sanitation workers began to remove the memorial to Brooks at the place of his death. The burned Wendy's was demolished. Georgia Law Enforcement Organization, a law enforcement nonprofit, began raising funds for Rolf to pay his legal fees, raising $500,000. Rolf was released on July 1 on a $500,000 bond with conditions. In May of 2021, the Atlanta Civil Service Board reinstated Rolf as an APD officer, saying he was not afforded due process in his firing. An employee at Husseini Islamic Center made a shocking discovery when she arrived at work just before 9 a.m. on March 2022. Call Eamon right now. I'm going to medical. <laughs> Hello, this police, is my mom. Do you need police? police? Fire or medical? I need police. I need police. Hey, what's the address? What's the address? Um, we're on Hester Avenue. What's the address? Is it? Yes. Yes. Okay, and what's going on there? Um, we run a mosque here 
and our caretaker, when we came in, we saw his pants on the floor. So we walked around the back, and I see him on the floor in the back, bent over, and laying on his back. Okay, tell me exactly what Listen, I said not in front, not in front of her. Okay, Maria, take Maria. Tell me what happened. And Alicia. Ma'am. Yes, hi. Tell me exactly yes, what happened. Okay, so we run, we run, a, I'm on the phone with 911. Okay. Okay, we run a school, we run a school at a community center, uh-huh. and we came in, the caretaker's pants were on the floor in front of the building, and that's not usual, and one of the girls saw a car take off when we pulled in, taking off in our caretaker's car, somebody pulled off in his car, and so we walked around to the back, and we see him on the floor, I think he's dead, I don't know. Okay, okay, listen to me, I know this is scary, I'm going to help you, okay? All right, is it the okay. back or the front? Come in the back. He's in the back. His body's in the back. In the back of the building? Yes. Okay. Are you right next to him right now? No, I ran back to the front. We have young kids. Okay, I need you to go back there. You don't want to go back there? Okay, I understand. No, I can't. Is there anybody there that will go back there to see him, see if we can help him? Um, Yeah. Okay. They're asking if anyone will go back there to see him. We can't. We can't go. We can't go. No, but no one can go. No, we just need nine one one to come here, please. They're already on their way. Okay. Okay. Can I get off the phone, right. please? Are you guys in a safe Are location? You- Is there a car you can get into that you can just sit there and wait for the paramedics? <laughs> So we don't yeah, know if yeah. the scene is secure. We don't know who drove we, off we in saw, We car. saw someone take off. We saw someone take off. We saw someone take off we in his car. Take off. Do you know what kind of vehicle it was? It was a blue van. It's the caretaker's van. Okay. They took off in his car. It was a big guy. Okay. I know that's all I know. And did you guys get a tag number or anything? No. Asia, you didn't get a license or anything, right? Asia? Asia. Asia. What did the guy look like? Okay, come in my car. Okay, I want you guys to be safe, so please come in the car. Come in my car. Okay, we're going in the car. Are the children in a safe place? Yeah, we've taken the kids. But two other workers have come. We've put all the kids in their car and they left. Okay. It's just me and two other teachers here right now. Make sure you're back. Okay. Hello? All right, I want you to tell me Hello? immediately if anything changes. I understand nobody wanted Hello? to go there, but I'm going to stay on the line until they get with you. And do you know what direction the van went? What? Do you know what direction the van Which went? Which direction did the van go? Right or right? Yeah. They left out of the building on, on the right. We hear the side. The police are here. Okay. Okay, I want you to go okay, to the police officer. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Seminole County deputies said the body of a 59-year-old man, believed to be a maintenance worker, was found at the center. Since one of the schoolgirls had seen a car race off, police were able to put out an alert. At a news briefing later that day, County Sheriff Dennis Lemma said the suspect was seen leaving the scene in the victim's blue 2006 Chrysler Town & Country minivan. Several hours later, the Indian River Sheriff's Office spotted the van in a Sam's Club parking lot. Body camera video released by the sheriff's office shows deputies nab the van at the traffic stop. When the suspect got out of the vehicle, he reached into his pocket and gestured with his fingers like he had a weapon. The deputies then opened fire when he tried to get back into the van. The suspect, later identified as 38-year-old Ahmed Roslan, was shot three times but was in stable condition. Investigators said he is considered possibly deranged. Raslan had allegedly thought the mosque was Julius Caesar's house, and he needed to protect it since he is a descendant. Authorities believe that the victim was likely killed by a shovel while trying to defend the mosque. His identity was not released, but he was a refugee from Iraq who was getting ready to return home following the death of his father. Raslan is now locked up in the Seminole County Jail. The comments on the next call toggled between heartbreak for the caller an absolute praise for the dispatcher. But the resounding feeling was that it is not one that is easy to forget. Twenty-seven-year-old mother Brittany Anderson placed a gripping 911 call to the Muskogee County Emergency Medical Service on February 2nd, 2021. 
The woman was desperate for help after being shot and was panicked about her children's safety. The accused, Jaron Dejon Prigen, allegedly initiated the call. 911, please fire ambulance. Hey, I uh, need ambulance. Let me hang up. Ambulance is the telephone number you're calling from. Uh, I don't know it. Um, on my phone, I see. Does that sound familiar? Hold on, one sec. Okay. Hello. This is the ambulance service. What's the telephone number? Hey, ambulance. Okay. What's the address where you need the ambulance? Okay. I've got help coming. Just repeat that address to make sure I have it right, okay? Okay, you said nine. Yes. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Um, uh, I can't explain. I have a consciousness right now. Okay. Well, I've got a lot of help coming to you, okay? You're going to hear silence for just a second while I get everyone started, but don't hang up. I'll be here. Okay. Okay, ma'am, are you alone? No. Hello, are you alone? No. My kids have Who has? My kids. I'm dying. I'm still here with you, okay? How many people are how many people are hurt? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. Help is already on the way, okay? I'm dying, please. Yes, ma'am. They're already on their way. The questions won't slow them down at all. They're with me. I'm terrified. When, when did this happen? No. Yeah. Is the assailant here still nearby? Can you hear me? Is the attacker still nearby? Yes. Okay. Is there any serious bleeding? I don't know. Okay, that's all right. Again, they're coming as fast as they can, okay? I'm hurting. Okay, they're coming I as fast know. as they can. Alright. I hear I'm, one baby. Alright, well I'm gonna stay on the line. I hear with you. I see okay. one baby. So I don't okay. hear my other kids. You don't hear your other and kids? Screaming. How many kids were there? I have eight kids. You said eight? Yes. Alright. Um, who what's the name of the person that did this to you? I can't say. You don't know his name? I can't say. Okay. Well, they're coming as fast as they can, okay? Okay. I'm still here with you, okay? Okay. Is, that, is the person still there with you? Ma'am, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I've got a lot of help coming to you guys, okay? Are you still with me? I'm here. Okay, they're coming as fast as they can, okay? And I'm still here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I promise they're coming as fast as they can. I'm still here with you. Just let me know when there's someone there. What's her name? Hope. What's your mom's name? Hope. Okay. And then what is your name? Remy. You said Remy? Brittany. Brittany, okay. Brittany, what's your last name? Anderson. 
Anderson. Okay. Can you tell me your birthday? Okay, ma'am. I'm going to let you go now. The officers are going to take care of you, okay? No worries. They're, they're getting ready to call you on the phone. Okay. And, okay, and they're going to call from a private or a blocked number, so make sure you answer, okay? Yeah. I'll let you go so they can call you. Pridgen had first called the dispatcher before passing the phone to Brittany. His voice was continually heard loudly in the background of the call, which revealed that Brittany's attacker was present for its duration. However, when the dispatcher asked for the attacker's identity, the woman refused to give it out, possibly fearing what Pridgen would do if she outed him. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that Pridgen was no stranger to Anderson and that some of the deceased kids were actually his. When authorities responded, the killer exited the house but attempted to flee when officers told him to drop his weapon. After a short pursuit, he was arrested and charged with six counts of first-degree murder for nine-year-old Cadence Anderson, six-year-old Nevea Pridgen, five-year-old Harmony Anderson, and the shooter's brother. One count of shooting with intent to kill Anderson and one count of possession of firearms after conviction or during probation. Turn around! I can't tell. Right hand. Gun in his right hand. Drop what's in your right hand slowly. Slowly put it down. Keep getting the He's running southbound. He's got a gun. Running southbound. He's got a gun. Southbound. Back to the west. Shots fired. Show us your head! Where's he at, Leach? Where's he at? Come with you, come here. Fuck. Watch your left hand. Show your hands! Contact north side. No. Show us your hands! I think he's right here. He's behind the tree over here. Walk this way with your hands up! Walk this way with your hands up! Which tree? Hands up! Which tree, Greg? The, second, the very back one. Walk this way with your Walk hands up! Walk this way with your hands up! Walk backwards! Keep walking! North side of Pleasant Valley. Do not know in your hands! Keep them up! Here, y'all want to focus on top. Keep walking backwards with your hands in the air. Do not reach for anything. Keep going. Keep going. We can prone my wherever Really, come over here. Keep. Okay. We're good. We can open here. Who's got? Gilly, you got hands? Keep we, walking backwards. We can prone them out right there. He's out open. Drop down to your knees. Fuck, dude. I can tell. We're approaching. Greg got hands. Do not move. There was a house. It's a door crack. It's about hard inside. What's your name? Brittany recovered from the injuries inflicted on her. However, a year after the incident, the bereaved woman said she had developed survivor's guilt. Although she has three other children, she believes she should have died in place of the five. The trial has faced numerous delays following missing transcripts, but the DA's office is currently pushing for the death penalty. The paramedics who took the call said that day would be something that would stick with them forever. Courtney Martinez and her fiancé, Adam, got lost in a snowstorm after opting to take another route to their home. Shaken by fright, Courtney then dialed 911 in the hopes of getting someone to rescue them. 911, what is your emergency? I'm walking in the field, I don't know where I am. You're walking in the field? Okay, I need you to just stop, okay? I'm going to try to find you on my screen. Did you go in the ditch? Yes, and then we started walking, we thought we were close to the house. Okay, can you go back to your vehicle? 
I can't. I don't know where it is. You don't know where it is. Okay. All right. I want you to just stay in line with me. It looks like I can find you. Oh, you're out on the prairie. One second. <sighs> what road were you driving on? We were coming up to Sarah Road. Okay, one second. Hello? Okay, I'm still online with you, okay? I have that car I got a call for too, Dave. <sighs> okay. How many people are with you? Me and one other person. Okay. I want you to just... Which way, do you remember which way you're walking or you totally got no, turned around? I don't know. Okay. What I want you to do is I'm just trying to pull you up on the map right now again to see if I can find a different location of which way that you're actually walking towards if you moved at all. Okay. What I want you to do is can you, which, you don't know which way, can you, can you start walking? Oh, I don't know. I need you to start walking. You don't know which way west is at all? You don't know no, which way Prairie Road is? I don't. You have to know which... I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I want you to start walking. You're going to have to start walking one way or the other, and at least then I'm going to be able to tell you which way to go, okay? <laughs> do, you, do you have enough clothing on? What? No, I came from a wedding. I'm in... I don't have any. Okay, all right. I'm going to um, page out some people, then obviously to help find you, okay? Okay, and that's what I'm going to do, okay? <laughs> okay, I want you to stay in line with me, okay? I'm crying. Okay. Courtney and Adam were natives of Green Lake County in Wisconsin. In December 2010, the two got trapped in a snowstorm after choosing to forsake the highway for a walk across the field which was supposed to lead them home. Frightened and with no idea how to get home, the distraught couple called 911. The sheriff's dispatcher told Courtney and Adam to dig into the snow for shelter. While communicating with them, she was able to find the latitude and longitude of their cell phone, which she then sent to the deputies. After two hours, the deputies used a GPS device to locate the couple, who were then rescued. Around 7 a.m., neighbors heard two people banging on the doors and shouting for help. Multiple 911 calls came in. The two, both in their 20s, had escaped the Mossy Meadow Drive house, but what they'd witnessed inside and what followed will haunt them forever. Hello, there's someone knocking a lot of times in front of my house saying someone tried to kill them. Someone's trying to kill them? Okay, where are you at? Give me one. Are they still outside right now? Yeah, they're like, we opened our window because we didn't want to open the door. Okay. Give me a second while I go ahead and get notes in for the officers, okay? Okay. And you said someone, uh, they're saying someone wants to kill them or do they want to kill themselves? I yeah, didn't... it's a female and a male and they keep ringing our doorbell and it won't move from Okay, are they, do door. you know if they're white, black, Asian, Hispanic? They're black. Both black? Yeah. Can you see what they're wearing by chance? Um, no. Oh, my name is... Yes. Okay, what's your last name? Uh, oh, my last name? Okay, what's a good phone number for you? Okay, and by chance, do you know them at all, anything like that? No, um, the guy, I just seen the guy was wearing burgundy shorts. Burgundy shorts? Yes. Any, uh, do you know if he's wearing a hoodie, a shirt? He doesn't have a shirt on. No shirt, no hoodie, no nothing? Yeah, no, nothing. What about the female? Um, the girl is wearing uh, black shorts and a, it looks like a black shirt as well. And they're from going the house to house right now. They just left her house and they're in front of our neighbors knocking, okay. I'm assuming. Do you know your neighbor's address real quick? Um, no. Okay, are they left or right of your house or across? Uh, across, but to the left. All right, we're going to have people come out there. 
if anything is to change, okay. go ahead and give us a call back, okay? Okay. Thank you. All right. No problem. All right. Goodbye. Okay. Okay. Five point nine one one. Where's your emergency? What's going on? Uh, someone's been shot. They're at my front door. I'm just talking to them through through the camera. There's two people, a man and a woman. They are in our driveway. Okay. What are they like? Twenty seventh. Uh, it's an African American woman. She's uh, she has dreadlocks, and an African American man. He has um, he doesn't have a shirt on. He's got on some basketball shorts, and she's in socks. And he's and he's saying that he's been shot. Uh, no, there's someone else that's been shot. Okay. Were you shot, ma'am, or was he shot? Was shot Somebody was shot in the house at 2734. 2734? Yes. I'm sorry, you can't come inside. All right, we're getting everyone started, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, I called the police for you. They're on their way. You're welcome. This is a great way to start the day. <laughs> Hello. Ma'am, are you still there? Yes, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, what's your name? Yes. And where are you currently at? What's your address? Um. Uh. Yes. Okay. Do you uh do the people outside your house know who shot uh, whoever's at uh 2734? Let Let me ask them. Okay. Do you know who shot the the person at that address? Um, the the man is saying that it was his father. Do you know if he still has the gun? Hold on. Okay. Um, do you know if he still has the gun? I'm sure he does. I don't know. I pulled a magazine out. Okay, he said he said he's he's sure that he still has the gun. He pulled the magazine out. What kind of gun was it? I don't know. But, you, do you, you don't know. Do you know uh, can you ask him if uh, his father's been drinking, doing any drugs, anything like that? Okay. Has your father been drinking or doing any drugs? Do you know anything like that? No, not that, not, not that I'm aware. I don't know. Okay. okay. Give me just a second. I'm still on the line with 911. I'll I'll call that number. Um. And do they? I I heard what they said. Uh, do you know? Um. Uh, if, uh, do you know? What is your father's name? What's your father's name, sir? What did they say? You said, is that correct? Yes. Okay, are they still outside your house currently? Yes, they are. And the, the woman is saying that the man she's with is her boyfriend. And she slept over at his house last night. It was the female's boyfriend? Yes. Nico! The, the, the two people that are in our, uh, they're standing in the driveway now. I think they, I hear the police. Okay. Okay, they came. They came Mommy! Shh, 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 shh. Are they still standing in your driveway currently? Uh, no, they're, they're standing in the, on the porch now. Are they talking with the police? No, um, I hear the police, but I don't see them right now. Okay. Can you stay on the phone with me uh, while yes. until the police talk with them? Yes. All right, thank you. I just need to know if they leave, anything like that. Okay. Are the uh, males, uh, can the male and the female hear you on the camera again or no? Um, I have to hold it to talk. Okay. Um, if by chance, can you ask them what uh, their father's wearing? Can you please tell me what your father's wearing? He's wearing gray. Gray shirt, black pants, top knee has on flip. Did you hear that, sir? No, I didn't. What did he say? He said gray shirt, gray pants, and slippers. And what's the boyfriend's name? What's your name, sir? That's the male's name? Yes. So the I'm just making sure the male on the porch is correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And what's the female's name? What's the woman's name you're with? Thank you. Did you get that, sir? No, I didn't. What is it? Uh, and can you ask them the name of the individual that was shot? Do you know the name of the person that was shot? No, they don't know who was shot. Okay. Can you tell them to step out to the front yard so that they can talk with police? Okay. 911 is asking you to step out to the front yard so that you can talk with the police. Okay. Are they here? Yes, they are. 
Yes, they are. They're at the house. I think they're walking. They're walking. They're walking over. The woman doesn't feel comfortable walking. What about the male? Um, they're both standing. Okay. Can you ask them just to step in front of your front yard? Okay. Just step down to the mailbox of our front yard, please. Okay. Uh, there's two officers in front okay. of our house. All right. They're speaking with them? Yes, they are. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. No problem. All right. Bye. When officers arrived, there were already four dead bodies inside the home. Before turning the weapon on himself, Robert Creighton Jr. had shot and killed his wife, 46-year-old Athalia Art Athena Creighton, and her three children, 18-year-old Kaysen Creighton, as well as Nyla and Nasir, aged 10 and 16. It soon became clear that Robert had been struggling with mental health issues beforehand. In fact, Officers had responded to the home about five times since 2014, and he had been involuntary committed to a mental institute a year prior. The crime scene was so haunting that even the police captain, who had 18 years of service, Matt Truitt, said he was not prepared for what he had witnessed. The mental well-being of responding officers also became a grave concern since many said they have never seen anything like it before. The shooter's wife, Athalia Creighton, had served as a sergeant in the Army's 2nd Infantry Division, contributing as a skilled heavy equipment mechanic. Beyond her military service, she was a life coach and interior designer. The two survivors were a 22-year-old man, a family member, and a 25-year-old female visitor. According to a neighbor, the man said that it was his father. He woke up and there was a gun to his head. Somehow he pulled the magazine out of the gun and they escaped. It remains unclear why the gunman chose to attack his family, and authorities said they will likely never find out. In November 2019, murder suspect Yvonne Serrano explained to dispatch how she had no recollection of why a woman, Daniela Taberas Maya, was dead in her driveway the morning of November 23rd. What's your address? What city? Okay, what's going on there? I don't know. I just walked up and there's a car in my driveway with a dead body. With what? Dead body. A dead body? Yes. Like a truck something. Okay, how do you know that they're dead? What kind of vehicle is it? Um, it's a small car. It's a Nissan or something. Okay, and you're say, how did you say you know they're dead? Uh, because I tried to, is the best of body next to the driver's side. Okay. Are they inside the vehicle? No, they're outside the vehicle. Okay. Does it look like they like shot themselves or like what? I I, I don't know what this. Look at it. And you don't know this person? Do you know who that is? I don't know. It's a new I I. No, but that person, do you know them? It's a girl. Yeah, do you know that girl? I, 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 I can't tell. You can't tell if you know them? No, because he's all blood and shit all over her. There's blood? Where's their blood coming from? I mean, she's a She'd be here for a while because... Okay. okay you're, you're positive she's not breathing? Uh, no, I can tell that she's not breathing. Okay, are there any, like, weapons laying around her? No. Nope. What I can see. Is she... Not that I can see. Okay, did you say if she's bleeding from anywhere or no? Oh, yeah. The head. 
She's burning and, from her head? Yeah. And it's running down my driveway, so she's sick. Okay. And you can't tell if you know her? No. Okay, just don't, obviously, don't touch her. Don't touch anything around her. Oh, you, that oh, oh well, shit. I, I just touched her because she told me if I know she was sick. Okay, all right, but other than that, just don't touch her. Do you know that silver Nissan? Do you know who that is? No. Okay, can you, without putting yourself in danger or anything like that, can you see the tag on that vehicle, the license plate? No. Oh, oh, wait a second. I okay. just got him because like, I was going to get out. And, oh, my God. Wait a second. Here, there, and there. It's, um... Uh... Okay, it, lo it looks like I got it here. I got it. Thank you. Uh, okay. I, I just, yeah, that, I that's, out. I'm sorry. yeah, that's perfect. That's it. coming back to exactly what you said. I just want you to know I have officers in route. I also have... Um, EMS in Route 2, just in case. I'm just going to stay on the phone with you till we get there. I have somebody right down the street, though. They should be there any second. Okay? Okay. I'm, I'm just, I just walked out and I just saw it. So I was like. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a little strange. Nobody else is there, though, right? It's just her laying on the ground? Yeah, yeah, I just. Okay. Okay, do you see an officer? Yes. Okay, just really, really quick, what's your first name? Okay, perfect. Go ahead and speak to my officers, okay? Okay. Okay, yeah, bye. Thank you. Up until 2006, the Serrano family lived a very uprooted life due to Douglas Serrano's military career. It was the same year that Serrano's high-ranking husband retired from the military after 28 years. She received her massage therapist license from Florida. Two years later, the family moved to Coral Springs and remained in the same home. For the first time, there was some stability in their lives. Douglas and Yvonne parted ways shortly after the move, and their oldest son joined the army just like his father. A married yet estranged woman and mother of four living in American suburbia would soon face a life-changing chain of events that began with her wanting to change her lonely life by joining a tight gym community. It was there that Yvonne Serrano became friends with 21-year-old Daniela Tavares Maya the woman who allegedly could not recall how her friend, Maya, would end up dead in her car, or even how she got home, contacted 911 as soon as she found the body. According to case reports, Serrano had been at World of Beer Bar when Maya offered her a lift home. Acquaintances and members of Coral Springs Gym reportedly described Serrano as intense, abrasive, and self-absorbed, and nothing like the nurturing and supportive members of the gym. Serrano was a loner type who just didn't seem to fit in, and allegedly her personality only became worse when she drank. When the opportunity arose to attend one of the monthly outings of gym members, Serrano, whose own membership had been suspended, was one of the first to sign up for the outing. The 51-year-old reportedly spiraled out of control, growing agitated, more intense, and intoxicated as the night continued. According to Serrano's estranged husband, Serrano had a history of violent behavior when she drank. Doug Serrano alleged that by drink number four, his wife would grow angry, and by her fifth drink, she was prone to episodes of violence. Surveillance footage of the early hours of that morning, as well as a text message found on the victim's phone during the investigation, confirmed that Maya did give Serrano a ride. According to the police investigation, Serrano had allegedly shot Daniela Tabaris with a 9mm Sig Sauer P365 pistol that Serrano supposedly had on her the night of the incident. The young woman's body was found in the driver's seat of her Nissan, with one foot still inside the car. Serrano had a concealed carry permit, and the police found the weapon in Serrano's bedroom, where she said she placed it between pillows. Serrano had allegedly changed her statement several times since she first dialed 911, but eventually admitted to deleting the camera on her doorbell and to washing the clothes she had worn the night before. Serrano was arrested and charged with tampering with evidence and murder, which was later changed to manslaughter. She faced 30 years minimum in prison. Prison. However, in 2020, a twist of fate, a judge set Serrano's bond at $20,000 and she was released to Gracious Care Recovery Solutions, a rehab facility located in Deerfield Beach for alcohol abuse. Tabaris Maya had been a student at Florida International University, attaining her associate's degree and working on her bachelor's degree when she was killed. Her family and friends remember her as a loving and kind person and very gym active. She belonged to the Training for Warriors family. Friends and family of the victim expressed their shock and outrage 
outrage at the judge's decision. Carolina Miller, Tiberius' friend, said, We cannot believe. We cannot grasp. We don't understand. We are speechless. Daniela's life was taken, and this person is going to a rehab place? Daniela's mother told the judge, This lady not only took my daughter's life, she also took away my life. Weddings can be drunken parties, but this one ended tragically. Winter Park 911. Hi, yes, I'm at I have a very irate, um, drunk guest. He has no shirt on. He's on the outside of the building. He's trying to beat people up. He's yelling. He's okay, very okay. drunk. Hey, no, you're, you're, yeah. you're giving me way too much. You're right. There's an intoxicated guest there, is that correct? Yes, he's being violent. Is he white, black, Hispanic? He is white, maybe Hispanic. Um, he has a black, white theater on. Okay, black tattoos. Pants. Tattoos, anything else? Sorry, uh, black pants and a black shirt. Sorry, was he out? Okay, and where at the facility is he? So, um, on the side by the dumpsters, it is the um, east side, the east side of the building right by the lake. The east side of the building by the lake? Yes. Yeah, he's starting to, to shove people's heads and um, beat people up. So. so he's shoving people's heads and starting to try to hit them? Yes, his older ladies and stuff, yeah. Okay, has he brandished or mentioned any weapons? No. Can you still see him? Yes. What's he doing now? He's grabbing an older woman and, and shoving her. Is he with them for you? No. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's getting bad. So they're, they're just saying for me to move away because people are making him mad. Anybody of authority is making him angry. Okay. Is anyone injured? Uh, possibly. Yeah, they, he, he's grabbing people's necks and like it's an older woman. I think it's his mom. Two people he puts in the floor. He's outside the building, right outside the door by the ballroom. So there's a vendor loading dock where there's an Arthur's catering truck. Um, that's where they'll want to come. There's a big Arthur's catering truck. And if they come there, that's where I'm standing. I can show them where it is. By the Arthur's catering truck? Yes, exactly. It's the loading zone right by the dumpsters and the electric vehicle charging station. That's where you're located? Yes, yes. Okay, I hear the sirens, yeah. So, yeah. I'm going to keep you on the phone until I know they can find you because it's dark and pretty busy there. Yeah, thank you so much. The cops are coming. Stay far away. No. Yeah. Okay, I, Okay. the cop is here. Okay, he's with you? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Okay, goodbye. Winter Park Police have released body camera video of the circumstances that led to a man being shot and killed at a wedding. Daniel Knight, the bride's uncle, is seen surrounded by other guests at the Winter Park Event Center on Morris Boulevard on February 19, 2022. Two officers responded and were directed to the 39-year-old who was reportedly battering guests. As officers approached, police say Knight's sisters were trying to calm him. The first clip is from the perspective of the first officer. It ain't got nothing to do with me. It's, it's his first wedding. You shut up. Back up. It's his back first wedding. Up. It's his back first up. wedding. Back up. You shut up. Listen, back up. It's his first wedding. He's got back up. Trina. Back up. Go that I'm Move out of the way. From Officer One's body camera, Knight is seen punching him in the head, knocking him to the ground. Police say Officer One was left unconscious. With Officer One down, Officer Two deploys his taser at the man, but it has no effect. Knight then punches Officer Two in the head, knocking him to the ground, and police say he continued to strike that officer in the head after the officer was down. At that point, the body camera video from Officer Two shows him roll over and discharge his firearm seven times at night, striking and killing him. Witnesses are heard screaming and telling police to call for an ambulance. Officials said police rendered medical aid tonight until medics arrived and took him to the hospital where he died. 
Winter Park police say FDLE asked them to wait and release the body camera videos until all 100 witnesses to the incident had been interviewed. The investigation is ongoing. Black Lives Matter Restoration Polk Inc. stood behind the family and their lawyers, saying in a statement that Knight's death was unjustified. The group claims the body cam videos were edited. A spokesperson said, Daniel Knight did not deserve to die. His children should not be fatherless. His fiance should not have lost her soulmate. His parents should not have to bury their son. His siblings should not have lost their brother. And most of all, this entire situation has devastated Daniel's family and friends and shook the entire community. Meanwhile, Florida Gulf Coast University's professor of forensic studies, Dr. David Thomas, said the shooting was justifiable since the officers were already down. However, he added that the police's de-escalation attempts weren't perfect. The Winter Park Police Department says the two police officers involved have a combined 47 years of experience. The officer who shot Knight remains on administrative duty, while the officer who was struck is back on full duty. The family has been adamant that the shooting was not justified, saying the 39-year-old was dead within three minutes of the police arriving. Witnesses and family members refute the police statement that an officer was knocked unconscious. Knight's mother, Patricia Kibi, said, My son did not deserve that. He did not deserve to be killed that way. Kibi said allegations that the man assaulted her were untrue, adding that she has no bruises. The bride, Janisha Paul, struggled to speak through tears. She said when she was growing up, Knight was always there with her and so sweet and caring. Paul recounted the traumatic event that ruined a day she had been looking forward to for months. His blood was all over the bride's wedding dress. A 22-year-old man, Aaron Ramsey, allegedly beat his father to death during a psychotic episode and then fled in May 2012. Ramsey's mother called 911 after she arrived home shortly after the incident and discovered her husband's body in a pool of blood. Welcome 911. What's the address of your emergency? 125 Signal Hill Road. Okay, what's going on over there? Someone was murdered, I think. Where? My where? Husband. Ma'am, I, ma I need you to listen to me right now and calm down. Yes. Okay. Where do you think someone was murdered? In my house. In your house? Yes. Okay. What's in your house? Please hurry. I, uh, ma'am, I'm going to get officers there in just a second. I need to know what's going on. What makes you think that someone was murdered in my your house? My husband is in a pool of blood. Your husband's in a pool of blood? Yes. How please, old? Please. Okay. All right. They're going to be there in just a second, okay? Yes. Did you just get home? Yes. Okay. Is anybody else home with you? I don't see anyone. Okay. Are you with your children right now? No, I, can't I, I, find, I don't see my son. He's gone. Okay. All right. How old is your son? 22. He's 22? What does he look like? This is really important, okay? Normal, but I think he has some problems. Okay. Go over to your husband for me, okay? Yes. Is he breathing? Are they on their way? They're, they've been on the way since you called. I'm talking to you, and my partner's going to talk to the ambulance and the fire department, okay? Is your husband breathing? I don't think so. Okay. Are you right next to him right now? Yes. Okay. Is he face up or face down? Face up. Okay. Can you get close to him? Yes. Okay. Not not really with the, the cord. Okay. Get it? Get if you have to his, put the his face is bludgeoned. His face is bludgeoned. Yes. Is there a weapon nearby? I don't see one. Okay. Yes. What? Yes. A, a pick or a hammer. A pick or a hammer. Okay. It's calm. Okay, ma'am. They're on the way. I need you to stay on the phone with me. I know it's hard, but I need you to stay on the phone. With oh, me. I can't believe this. Okay. No. Listen to me, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am. Yes. I need, this, what I'm going to tell you right now is very important. Yes. Okay. I do not want you to touch anything. Okay. 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 Are you certain that your husband is not breathing? I don't know. I, I, I go. If you want, put the phone down. Okay. Try and get close to him as possible. Do not touch the pick. No, Don't. there is just so much blood. I know. I know. This is important. We're gonna... I, I, I'm sure he's not moving. He's not I, moving? I touch him. All right, all right. If you call his name, does he move? Ed? 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 No. Okay. No, I can't believe this. Okay. Oh, God, this happened. 
It's okay. I'm here. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm staying here with you until they get there. Okay. I'm in Wilson, you know. I know. I know. You're at 125 Signal Hill Road, correct? Yeah. And this is Ramsey. Yeah. Okay. All right. How soon? How soon will they be here? They're gonna be there in just a few minutes. Oh, I can't. I can't. This is. I can't do this. Okay. I, I can't do this. All right. If you think he's beyond help, what you can do, you can leave the house if you want. No. No, I'm staying here. Okay. Do you not if if you think he, do you think he's beyond help? Aaron Ramsey brutally beat a 73-year-old father, Edward Ramsey, and then ended his life with several blows from a knife, including one to his neck. The man was found lying in a pool of blood in his Signal Hill home kitchen by his wife, who immediately called 911. Police had just responded to a call from a neighbor on Chee Spring Road and had found Aaron Ramsey covered in blood, flailing and refusing to respond to questions. After police responded to Edward's call, they pieced two together and discovered that the killer had just been sent to the hospital. The 22-year-old, who reportedly had a recent history of mental illness, was arrested and held on a $1 million bond. He was charged with murder, attempted first-degree larceny, and attempted first-degree burglary. The killer had allegedly been hearing voices, and when asked why he killed his father, he explained that he had heard his father playing the piano downstairs and believed that he was playing the music to control him. He admitted to police that he had killed his father, as voices in his head had told him that his father had special powers and that he was lying to him. The voices allegedly told him to end it all, and that is what he did. During his month-long hearing the following March, the court heard how Ramsey heard voices telling him that his father was going to cause an apocalypse and turn everybody on earth into zombies. The unanimous verdict was passed by the three-judge panel who heard the accounts of that day and found Aaron Ramsey not guilty because of insanity. Ramsey was ordered to spend the next 50 years at Connecticut Valley Hospital in Middletown. Six years later, in 2019, Ramsey tried to contest his sentence, asking to be let out of the high-security prison hospital. He spent an hour on the stand telling the court why he should be allowed back into society, stating that this illness is a genetic disposition and sharing his remorse over killing his father. However, a sooner release date has not been given. In November 2018, a Champion Township man, Billy Ray Morrow Sr., broke into the home of Heather York and her husband, Kenneth. The attempted burglar was shot in the arm and later charged with aggravated burglary. 911, what's your emergency? Somebody's breaking into our house. What's the address? Hall Street. How many are there? I don't know. Where are they at? I don't know. I don't know. He's coming in. He's coming in. All right. Where are you at in your house? In the living room. What does he look like? I don't know. He got the, the lights are out. All right. Oh, my God. Where are you at in the house? In the living room. Where is he coming in at? The back door. My husband's got the gun on him. Oh my god. Alright, stay on the oh line god. with me. Oh my god. Stay on the line. Oh my god. Alright, what's your husband's oh my god. name? My husband shot him. My right. husband shot him. Alright. Alright, stay on the line with me. Husband just shot him. He shot. In, in the hallway. Is he? He's in the house. All right. What does he look like? I don't know. I don't Do you know where he now. shot? Yes, I don't know. Is he on the ground? He's on the ground. My husband told me to get on the ground. Okay. He's in the house. He's in the kitchen. All right. <laughs> What's your name, ma'am? You're doing a great job. I need you to take a really deep breath for me, okay? Oh, my God. Okay. Is your husband able to talk to me on the phone? No, I'm not, I'm not going in there. I'm like, but I'm not going in there. What, ma'am? We got, I'm not going in there. Our, our whole yard is fenced in. Okay. I don't... Where is your husband at in the house with the gun? He's in the dining room. Where's the mail at still? He's in the 
attention. My husband's got the gun on him. All right. Is, where is he shot? Ask your husband where he is shot. Where is he shot at? In the arm. In the arm? Don't go near him. Is he breathing? Don't go near him. Uh, is the male subject you guys shot breathing? Yeah, he's breathing. He's talking to him. who had attempted to break into the home on Hall Street at about 1 a.m., was shot in the arm by Kenneth York as his wife was on the phone to 911. According to the homeowners, they heard their dogs barking and loud noises coming from their kitchen, and the suspect had allegedly broken through one of the glass panes in the wooden door and managed to unlock it. Kenneth York had reportedly yelled that he had a gun repeatedly, but Morrow continued to make his way into the home, and that is when a shot was fired. Kenneth managed to get Morrow to the ground with his hands up where they awaited police. Morrow Sr. was taken to hospital. He was later booked into Trumbull County Jail, still in his hospital gown, and charged with aggravated burglary. The burglar reportedly has a long history with the police and with breaking the law. According to Kenneth York, he keeps the 38 caliber pistol in the house for his family's protection, and it's not the only one he owns. A shaken up, Heather York had credited their safety and awareness of the break-in attempt to their dogs, who barked when Morrow had been outside. She stated that they would probably still been asleep in bed if it weren't for them. Two men made a bad decision in July 2018 by jumping onto a moving train. One of them called 911 in a panic. 911, what's your emergency? Um, uh, me and, me and my friends step on the train because we, like, kind of jumped on it. The train is, like, going really, really, really fast. And I really don't know where we're at or where we're going. Okay, I'm sorry. What happened? Uh, I'm on the train. We were going really, really fast, and I don't know where I'm going. Okay, you're following a what? A vehicle, or...? No, I'm on a train. You're on a train. Yeah, and it's going really fast, and I don't know where it's going. Okay. Do you work for the company, or...? No. Okay, what are you doing on the train? Well, I uh, really don't know that question because it's stupid. And I think it's going to be... It's better than walking, which is really scaring the shit out of me. Okay, so do you need police then, or? I mean, do you have any stops or no? I'd have to try and connect you with the railroad company. Um, can you please do that, sir? Okay, hold on for me really quick. Right. 
The CSX train was traveling from Huron County to Wayne County around 4 a.m. when 20-year-old Christian Hale and 24-year-old Kevin Sloan jumped onto it. But when the train picked up speed, the men couldn't get off and hung onto the outside of two cars for 60 miles. Wayne County Captain Doug Hunter estimates speeds reached 40 to 50 miles per hour during the wild ride. Near Doylestown, Hale frantically dialed 911 and explained the confusing situation to a dispatcher. The dispatcher notified CSX, which stopped the train at the Whitman Road crossing in Chippewa Township. However, the train hoppers took off. Deputies found them about a mile away, and body camera video captured their arrests. They were charged with trespassing. 20-year-old Hale told the deputy that he only planned to ride the train through Willard, saying, I should have never gotten on the train. I know it was a stupid idea, and I never should have did it. I wasn't going to, and I never will again. At the time, CSX's own police department was considering pursuing additional charges, but that outcome was not published. According to Operation Lifesaver, Ohio ranked 11th in the country in railroad trespass casualties in 2017, with 15 deaths and 13 injuries. In the early hours of May 19, 2019, a Wooster Pike Road McDonald's employee called 911 after a naked teenager ran up to them in the parking lot. The teen told the fast food workers that she had been sexually assaulted in Stockbridge. Just over 15 minutes later, Sean Giralt placed a call to 911, telling the operator very matter-of-factly that he had just shot his girlfriend, Rachel Asbell. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Please help me, it's... Uh... Uh, 4777 Drive, Medina, what? Ohio, in the head. What? You what? I shot, I shot her in the head. Shot her. You shot who in the head? My girlfriend. Your girlfriend? How old is your girlfriend? Uh, four. I, I don't want to call it. She needs help. Okay, do you still have the weapon? I, I don't even know where it is. I don't even know where it is. I, I've been looking for it. I have no idea where it is. You don't know where the gun went? No, it fucking fell or something. I, I have no idea. There's broken glass. There's. All right. I have no idea. Hold on one second for me. For a 44-year-old female. Okay. Uh, Sir, do you have something yes. on the bleeding? I, yes, I, I have a rag on the bleeding right now, but she's... Okay. She's moaning and, and she's not doing well. Hang on one second. Yeah. She's not doing well. Oh my God. Okay. Oh my what's God. Her, what's her name? Rachel Asbell. A Z B E L L. What What happened? That you was it an accident or? It, it, it uh, was a disagreement, and it got out of control, and... Disagreement that got out of control? Yes. She's in rough shape, please. Do you have the door unlocked for them? I'll open it right now, here. There. It's in the garage. We're in the garage. You're in the garage right now? Yes. I just opened it. Okay. Oh my God. Just apply the pressure to her head on that rag, okay? Okay. Just stay on the line with I, me. I don't know about this. She's still fighting. She's still fighting. I'm going to go to jail, though. I did this, all right? I can't be here. Oh my God. Oh my God, she just died. She just died. Oh, my God. Okay. Are you able to do CPR? She's she's still fighting. She's still fighting. Wait. Come on. Hey, fight. Fight. You got it. Come on. Fight. Okay. Fight. Okay, sir. Yes. All right. I've got officers right down the road. I need you to exit the house and go down towards the street with your hands up. But I'm holding the pressure. They're, they're right down the road. They need you to exit the oh, garage this, with your hands this, up. They're still pretty far away. I, I gotta uh, hold the pressure. Okay. 
I need you to exit the house. They're telling me to have you exit the house with your hands up and well, go towards the street. I, I understand that, but they're pretty far away, and i got to hold this pressure to her head. Because that's the thing that's going to keep her alive. Okay, sir, I've got numerous officers on the way. He wants you in the street before he gets there. That's fine. I don't care what that officer wants. Oh, my God. I can't okay. believe I do this. Okay, I understand. The, I the, he can see this. the garage door, but I need you to go out in the street before he'll approach the house. No, that's not going to happen. He needs to come into the garage. I will leave the garage. As I see the lights coming up right now, I will leave the garage as soon what, as he gets up here. What, what's your name, sir? Sean Gillero. She's alive. She's alive. Help her. She's alive. I have children in the house. Come help her. Just come help her. Or shoot me. I don't give up. I don't care. Okay, they don't want to do that. Put nah. Shoot. Put your hands up. Shoot me. Please. Put your hands up. Please shoot me. I'm holding her face. And I'm talking to your ER. Put your hands up right now. I'm trying to help her. Put your hands up. Shoot me. Get the shoot me. Get shoot me. Shoot me. Shoot me. Shoot me. Shoot me. Shoot me. I'm not, I'm not playing that. Only three minutes into the call, the police arrived at the scene. They told the 45-year-old to come out and put his hands up, which he refused to do, even taunting the officers to shoot him. Geralt's mother, who lives in Florida, also called 911, stating that her son had told her he had shot his partner. Responders determined that Geralt's two children were still in the house during the police standoff, but they couldn't figure out what the shooter was. Just after 2.30 a.m., they managed to rescue the children, aged 12 and 15 years old, by using a ladder up to the second story window. Once they'd done this, they were able to remove Asbel to safety and send her to a trauma center by helicopter. Three hours later, SWAT used a robot to enter the residence through the front door. At 4.30 a.m., authorities declared Geralt was found dead in the basement. He had committed suicide. At the time of the call, the link between the McDonald's incident and the murder-suicide was unclear, but soon authorities found out they were related. In fact, both were perpetrated by Geralt. The teen told investigators that she escaped sexual assault by the 45-year-old when she fled to the fast food restaurant. Claims backed up when investigations into the shooter uncovered that he was examined in 2014 for a possible sex offense, alleging that Geralt had touched and made sexual comments towards the then juvenile living in the house. It's unclear if the victim was a 17-year-old or one of the other children. In addition to this, the report said the accused had made a comment that he wanted to shoot someone in the face. After the report was sent to Medina Municipal Court for review, Prosecutors decided not to authorize the charges due to a lack of evidence. Meanwhile, the two children rescued from the house told police the accused was intoxicated during the altercation. They said the family had been bowling the night before. All three children then gone to sleep, which is when Asbel was shot. Asbel's daughter said she woke up and fought off Geralt, who was trying to sexually assault her while she was asleep. This was when she fled the house. The other two children barricaded themselves in a room until the police rescued them midway through the three-hour standoff. In a press conference the following day, Montville Township Police and Medina Country officials revealed that Asbel had been declared medically brain dead in hospital and was on life support while her family explored organ donation. Officials said the 44-year-old was shot almost execution style. According to officials, they found Geralt standing over his girlfriend of seven years, who he had shot in the head in the garage. However, after opening the garage door for officers, he refused all orders to surrender and ran into the home, which was the start of the three-hour standoff. Unsure of whether or not he had a gun, they backed off until SWAT arrived. It also came to light that the children had called their mother during the standoff, which led to her arriving at the property during the rescue. Police say Asbel's daughter was with relatives after the incident, and the other children are now in their mother's care. Hugo Selva shot and killed his girlfriend, Nicole Novak, on February 7, 2018. After further investigation, 
the Florida killer was also linked to several other shootings, including that of Charles Brown. Hello? Hello? What's going on there? I'm trying to tell you the truth of what happened. What happened where? On Wilder. Okay. And I keep getting name? transferred. Okay, what is your name? My, my name? And what's the number that the detective can give you a call at? The phone, the phone number? I don't know my phone number. Okay, can they call you at the number on our screen? Yes. Okay, are you in Delray Beach now? Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, let me see. Yeah, are you a witness or are you possibly involved? I did it. Okay. All right. And how old are you? 22. 22. And you still have your weapon with you? Yes. Okay. Okay. And can you tell me what happened? Or do you, would you rather talk to a detective? I'd rather talk to a detective. Okay. Give us a phone, a call back at this number, the number. Does that I think sound so. Familiar? Okay. All right. If it should come back. It's, been, to, it's a new phone. Okay. If somebody should call you and it's from a blocked number, you need to pick it up because that will probably be the detective calling, okay? I'm in shock right now. Okay. Do you want the paramedics to respond to you? No. Okay. Are you home by yourself or at a friend's house? or? I'm, I'm just scared. I have the mother of my child, and I'm just scared. Okay. Do you have your child with you? No. Okay. Is she okay? Yes. The, mo the mother of your child's okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'm gonna ha I'm gonna get off the phone with you, and then I'm gonna have a detective call you. Okay. Okay. I was just scared. Okay. We we can. I operated out of fear, and okay. I wasn't showing love. Okay. All right. Well, you can tell that to the detective. Okay. He'll probably ask you to meet him okay. somewhere. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Jackie from the police department again. The detectives can't call you, but can you come into our station, into our lobby, and meet with one of them that are that's here, or that will be here when you get here? Sure. Okay. You do you know where we're at? We're at 600 Banyan Boulevard. Okay. And that's downtown West Palm Beach. Okay. Okay. What kind of car are you going to be coming in? What car are you driving? The kind of car that I'm driving? Yeah. It's a rental car. Oh, rental? All right. And your girl, your child's mother is going to be with you? Is my child's mother going to be with me? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, just, when you come into the lobby, there's two black phones on the wall. Just pick one up and ask for me, okay? Okay. What's your name? Jackie. Okay. All right. I'll see you soon. 22-year-old Hugo Selva reportedly had no previous criminal history prior to the tragic events that occurred in February 2018. Police believe that the 911 call made by Selva on the 6th of February suggests that he had tried to turn himself in before the chaos of the following day. Selva had allegedly shot his drug dealer, Charles Brown, in self-defense in West Palm Beach. The dispatcher requested for him to go to the station to tell detectives what had happened, but she did not follow up. Authorities could find the surveillance footage outside of my neighbor market on the south end of Lake Worth. The footage shows Selva with his 26-year-old girlfriend and the mother of his child, Nicole Novak. The footage shows him shooting her fatally in the head and then driving away after dragging her body into the rented Nissan southbound. When authorities arrived at the scene, all that was left was a pool of blood where Novak had fallen out of the vehicle upon being shot. Numerous calls had been made to 911 about a crazed driver on the I-95 highway. 911, 
I'm on emergency. Hey, I'm on 95 northbound and uh, just south of Belvedere Road exit, and some guy just, just like, driving backwards on the highway in a black Nissan. Okay, this is, uh, like, okay, wait a minute, listen. This is on 95? Yeah, so well, this okay. is on the shoulder okay. now. Okay, where? Where on 95? Yeah. Just just south of Belvedere, on 95 northbound, just south of Belvedere. But he's going south okay. of the northbound lane. Hold on, hold on. Charnette, I think that's going to be the 33. Um, I got a, a black Nissan on 95 going the wrong way. And he, he was like a white male. Like, I saw him really clearly. He looked like he was kind of girl, to be honest with you. They're going southbound in the northbound lane. Yeah. Okay, um, FHP, just let you know, um, we are working a shooting that just occurred, and the vehicle is a black Nissan, and that's... Um, okay, yeah, and you're from what is an SUV, yeah. It's a, what, what is it, you said it's an SUV? Yeah, so it's a black SUV. Okay, so ours is a Nissan. Let me double check and see what kind of vehicle it is. Okay. It's probably already a brand new. Yeah, we're getting yeah. multiple calls. Yeah. Oh, my God. Hi. Hi, I'm traveling on 95 Forest Hill Boulevard and in the um, going northbound. Yeah, we already have it. Is this a vehicle driving in the wrong lane? Yeah. Yeah, we, we already have it. Yeah, my mom, I'm on your side, but it's not passing forward, too. I just saw an SUV type vehicle on I-95 driving in the opposite direction in emergency lanes. It would have at least 100 miles per hour going towards traffic. Yes, we, we, do, we, we are aware he was actually involved in an incident. We're trying to get him now. Where's the last place you saw him? I just saw he's on Forest Hill and headed towards Lake Worth. He just made me down towards Lake Worth area, not headed down towards Lantana. Okay, so he's on, he's passing Forest Hill in 95, right? Yes, but he's probably now in Lake Worth, if not Lantana. He was going at least 100 miles per hour. I mean, it was scary. I've never seen a car going that fast in the opposite direction on 95 in the emergency lane. Yeah, no, I understand. We we're, we do have deputies in the area. Thank you so much for the call. There is a car traveling the opposite direction. Uh, I'm with, uh, I was in the, I mean, they almost hit me. He's going at a high rate of speed, 80, 90 miles an hour in the right, right direction. I mean, he's going faster than the traffic going northbound. I mean, ridiculously fast. I killed somebody. Yeah. Yeah, that's got a lot of calls on it. Oh, I'm assuming you did. Yeah. God, oh, that yeah. is not a survivable. Yeah. Uh, he was going about 100 or more miles. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was probably like um, maybe a black Nissan SUV is what I'm guessing. I just hope that they yeah. can find him. It's probably, like I said, it's probably all related. Because he came from 6th Avenue. It started in Lake Worth. And then he took 6th Avenue south down to the northbound lane. Okay. So that's, that's probably where this it started. Yeah, this is probably it. Because he, he, we, we got the report of the wrong way. It started in Okeechobee. Yeah, so I, cause it looked, they said that we have northbound just north of Lantana, which is 6th Avenue, but they have a fatality. So that's probably what they're talking about now. But hold on mm -hmm. a second. Looks like we're getting an update. Okay. Looks like we got him, sir. And that's going to be at at High Forest. I mean, uh, at Avenue. Uh, where's the where's the Lantana 95. Yes, yeah, so that's what they're Lantana talking 95. about. Yeah. Okay. All okay. right. We'll go ahead and shut it down. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. In the early hours of that same day, Anthony Fonti found the couple asleep in their SUV in his driveway in Benwater Circle. According to Fonti, he and Selva used to sell marijuana together but that the two hadn't spoken in over four years and that he did not know why he was there that night. Fonti reported that he had knocked on the window, telling them to leave. The killer had then shot him through the windshield before driving away. The bullet had struck Fonti in the shoulder. Further investigation led authorities to find 29-year-old Edvin Milkevic in a crash Nissan 370Z on southbound I-95 later that same morning. Milkevic had been taken to Del Rey Medical Center, where he reportedly died from gunshot wounds. Little is known as to why he had been shot or his connection to Selva, but ballistics later showed that the bullet found removed from Novak's head matched the bullet found in the crash victim. After striking three cars head-on, the vehicle came to a stop near the Latana exit on northbound I-95, where authorities could intercept. Florida Highway Patrol troopers 
reportedly used a taser on the 22-year-old, but it did not work. According to police, Selva was not cooperating or listening to their commands. And as a result, Deputy Connor Ha shot and killed him. The highway was closed for several hours that day. A lawsuit has been filed against the state claiming that the dispatcher on the call with Selva the day before the I-95 crash should have followed up to ensure that Selva had indeed gone through to the station as she had instructed him to do in the call. According to attorney Gary Cohen, she completely dropped the ball, Cohen said. You have a man with a gun who has already shot somebody. The state has said that it does not comment on active lawsuits, but that West Palm Beach police issued an alert for Selva's black SUV and that the dispatcher did inform detectives on the case. Palm Beach County Sheriff's deputies' actions were later declared justified and that it was a response to the danger Selva was to himself and others. A failed attempted murder-suicide in October 2019 when 94-year-old Venice man Wayne Julen turned the gun on himself after killing his 80-year-old wife who was suffering from dementia, but his plans were foiled. Aaron, Nine one one. The location they were into. Yes, uh, I've had a death in the family. I need uh, oh an ambulance, I guess, from the police. What's your address? My address is. Uh, Do you know I the new, like, want... numerical address? Pardon? Do you know like the yeah, actual I... address? Oh, the address is. Okay. It's my wife. Yeah. And what's the closest cross street or corner to that location? Uh, um, Pinebrook, Pinebrook, and East Venice. Okay. We're right behind, right behind Publix. And you said it was. Uh, this is uh, no. This is uh, yeah. okay. And what's the phone number you're calling from? Uh, I'm calling from my from my cell phone, which is. Uh, okay, tell me exactly what happened. Well, she died. She died. Who died? My wife. My wife. Okay, so she's there with you right now, and she's you say she's, she's dead. She's in a. She's sitting in a chair, and she's dead. Okay, just stay in line. Just one second. Okay. I'm just updating his information, so one second. Okay. And are you with her now? Well, yes, I live here. We, we live in... Right, but you're there with her right now? Um, yes, I'm there. Okay. And how old is she? 80 years old. Okay. Her name is... And just to confirm, is she awake? No, she is dead. Now, just to confirm, is she breathing? No, she is not okay. breathing. She is totally dead. Right, I am sending paramedics to help you now. Just stay in line. Okay. And please tell me, why does it look like she's dead? Pardon? Why does it look like she's dead? Uh, well, she she's all white, pale, and and hasn't hasn't moved for a couple hours. And no pulse. No pulse. Okay. She right. definitely definitely passed away. Okay. Do you think she's beyond any help? No, she she is beyond help. She needs to go to to uh, uh, the funeral home. Okay. Or wherever, wherever they take her. Okay. I'm sending someone to assist you. Please leave everything as you found it. Is there anything else we can do for you? No, no. That's, okay. that's fine. Okay, okay, bye. If you can just repeat your address, just make sure I have it right. It's... Yes. All right. They're on the way out there. Thank you. All right. No Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The 94-year-old had informed police upon arrival at their Aston Gardens home 
that he had intended to kill himself too, but that the gun had malfunctioned. He had even written a very lengthy suicide note, according to law enforcement. Authorities also reported that the man was very cooperative with the police. Paula Falk with the Senior Friendship Center said that the event was tragic and that many individuals do not seek help in taking care of their loved ones. They try to do it on their own. Chief Matt Muller added that, caregivers are under a lot of stress and there are resources available to them. Unfortunately, these people didn't take care of those, take advantage of those resources, and it's now a tragic ending. Julian was arrested and charged with first-degree premeditated murder and booked here into the Sarasota County Jail on no bond. On January 4th, 2015, Shelley Ray Gilbert made a call to 911 after her 30-year-old son, Thomas, Tommy Gilbert Jr., shot his 7-year-old father in the head in his parents' New York City apartment, a killing that shocked the upper-class Manhattan society. 911, where's the emergency? It's at 20 Beekman Place. 20 Beekman Place. 20 Beekman Place, zip code 10022. What are your cross streets? Uh, 50th and 51st. Are you in apartment or private house? 8, D is in David. Uh, David on what floor? Uh, 8. What's the emergency today, ma'am? Um, my husband is, I think, dead. Okay. Please I'm rush. Connect you to EMS. Do not hang up, okay? Hello. Okay, hello, floor. Is the ambulance for you or for somebody else? It's for my husband. Is he awake? He's a dead, I think. I will see, ma'am. He's 60. He just turned 70. Okay, there's somebody there with you? Me, no, just him and me. And he's not breathing? What? I don't think so. I can't get a pulse. Okay. Stay with me one moment. Okay, that's at uh, uh, 20 Beekman Place, apartment 8 D is in David, in the uh, borough of Manhattan, correct? Yes. How long will you be? All right, I've already got the call out. All right, they'll be there quickly. You're getting firemen, the police, and the EMS. Uh, is he on the floor? Or in yes. He's on the floor, okay. Uh, I want you to open up his shirt. Okay. He's wearing a turtleneck. All right, uh, in which case, if you could kneel next to his chest. Okay. Yes. Is there somebody to call to help you out, or? No. Right, okay. Um, kneel next to his chest, put your uh, left hand on the center of his chest. Yes. Just above the, uh, you know, the middle of his chest. Uh, put your second hand on top of the first. Yes. All right. I have to put you on speaker. Hang on. Just be careful. Don't hang up, okay? Hello? Okay, I'm still here, ma'am. Hang on. Hello? I'm still here. Okay. I'm pressing down. I've been watching Chuck. Okay. Emergency shows, like hospital shows. Uh, like I understand. Keep your elbows straight. Use your, the, the weight of your upper body to, to put I think them. he's just dead. He's been shot. He's been shot? Yes. Okay. Uh, are you still willing to try to do... Uh... I'm doing compressions now. Okay. Keep your uh, elbows straight. Can I ask her a question, Aro? What's that? Can I ask her a question? Yes. Hello, ma'am. You said your husband was shot? Yes. How long ago? Probably 10, 15 minutes ago. 10, 10 minutes ago, maybe. 10 minutes ago he was shot? Maybe 15. Uh, by whom? My son, I, who is nuts. But I didn't know he was this nuts. According to his mother, the Princeton graduate reportedly arrived at the Upper East Side home to discuss business with his father. He had requested that Gilbert go out and get him a sandwich and soda that he knew wasn't kept in the house. She had obliged and left home, but moments later felt a sense of dread was over her. She found herself in the bathroom of their apartment less than three minutes later, where her husband lay dead in a pool of blood with a gun placed in his hand, and her son had disappeared. Thomas Gilbert Jr. was arrested on charges of first-degree murder the following day. The scene had been described by officials as an attempted staged suicide, as the 40 Glock 22 had been found resting in the victim's hand. Upon further investigation, police uncovered two 40 caliber magazines matching the gun found at the scene at Gilbert Jr.'s Chelsea apartment that led to his arrest. The 2009 Princeton graduate had reportedly struggled to remain employed and lived off the wealth of his successful parents. He had been receiving a $1,000 allowance, his rent and Jeep had been paid for, and his club memberships as well. According to the victim's wife, Gilbert Sr. had slowly been decreasing the killer's allowance and, before the time of the murder, had decreased it to $300.
arguing that his son must find a job and begin taking care of himself. Alex Spiro, defense for the accused, and Gilbert had argued that his actions resulted from his mental illness, claiming that he suffered from schizophrenia and that he was not aware of his actions at the time of the murder. However, officials believe that the murder was an act of entitlement and revenge and that it had been premeditated as further evidence found that the gun had been purchased several months earlier in Ohio. Before the killing took place, Gilbert Jr. had allegedly been researching websites, including websites such as HireAKiller.com and Hitman.com. Not only was the murder found to be premeditated, but the prosecution had proved the killer to be fully aware of his actions and morals as he had cleared the apartment by asking his mother to go out, showing that he knew what he was about to do was wrong. Just over four years later, in June 2019, Thomas Gilbert Jr. was found guilty for the murder of his father and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years served. His mother, Shelley, spoke about his mental illness being kept a secret as per her son's request and how difficult it was not knowing just how sick he was. She said that she would continue to fight for her son to be transferred to a psychiatric facility to receive the mental treatment she believes he requires. On April 8, 2016, Fiona Schupin from Lavington, Australia went into cardiac arrest. Her partner, Sean Wong, quickly dialed triple zero for assistance. Ambulance emergency, what is the town or the suburb? Lavington, New South Wales. Tell me exactly what's happening. She just, she just, she's just hit the floor real bad. Somebody has collapsed or fallen? No, my partner, she's collapsed. Are you with her at the moment? Yeah, I'm with her head up. How old is she? Oh, she's in early 40s. All right. Is she's she, changing colour. Is she it's awake? Like, no, she's okay. changing colour. I'm going to tell you what to do. Is, oh, she breath breath. is she breathing? Just. Just? Yes. Okay, she's not turning blue? Yes, her lips are starting to, she's starting to dribble, dribble, dribble. She's trying to gasp the air as I speak. Right, I. so do you think she stopped breathing? She did, and she just, she's, now she is again. She's breathing now, is she? Yeah, and then she just stops again. Okay, is she awake? No. Oh, what's happened? She hasn't I, taken anything she shouldn't have? I don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. She was just sitting here at the table mm. and just collapsed. All right. Is there a defibrillator in the house? No. No. I'm organising the ambulance as we're speaking. Stay oh. with me and I want to tell you what to do. Oh, please. Okay, are you right next to her? Yes, I'm just trying to hold her head up. Right, okay. I want you to lay her flat on her back. Yep. Take away any pillow you've got under her head. Take away. Take away any pillows. Yep. Kneel next to her and look in her mouth for food or vomit. Is there That's anything in, is there anything in her mouth? No, I can't see anything. Now, I want, now I want you to check her breathing properly. Place your hand on her forehead. On her forehead. Your other hand under her neck. Tilt her head back. Yep. Put your ear next to her mouth. Can you feel and hear any breathing? She is slightly, but she's foaming from the mouth as well. All right. And she's gasping. Okay, I'm going to tell you what to do. Right, I listen to me carefully. Yeah. <laughs> right, <-o. laughs> Come on. She's gasping. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to start off with some ventilation, so listen to me carefully. I'm yeah. going to tell you how to give mouth to mouth. Is the front door open? Yeah, it's locked. Go and open it quickly and come back to me. <laughs> quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's done. Right. You're back now. You're listening to me? Yeah, yeah. Tilt her head back. Yeah. Pinch her nose closed and completely cover her mouth with your mouth. Then blow two regular breaths into the lungs, about one second each. The chest okay. should rise with each breath. See what you can do with that. Okay. Just do that. Pinch her nose. Oh. Now, did you feel the air going in and out? No, she's going all cold. No, good. try again. Til I'm trying. I'm til trying. Tilt her head back. I'm trying. Her mouth is locked shut. Okay. Right -o. Well, we're going to have to do, I'm going to tell you how to do resuscitation with compression. Place the heel of your hand on the breastbone in the center of the chest, right yes. between the nipples. Put, yes. your, put your other hand on top of that hand. Yes. You're going to press down 
two inches with only the heel of your lower hand touching the chest. Okay. Now listen carefully. Yes. Pump the chest hard and fast. They're already on the way and this is important. You press down hard and fast twice per second. Okay. And we're going to do this 600 times or until health can take over. Let the chest come all the way up between pumps. Count out loud so that I can count with you. And we are starting now. One, one, two, three, four. Faster. One, two, three, or four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Keep going. They're coming as fast as they can, and you're doing a good job of keeping that blood around. Just keep going. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. She lifts her head up and tries to breathe every now and then. Well, you said she was unconscious and she wasn't breathing enough. Are you doing the Are you doing the compressions? I can't work it out. Her eyes are open and they're all red, but once well, her left her left eye's tilted to the left. Has she spoken to you? No. No. Keep pump the chest hard and fast. Um, Will she I let can you? Hear the sirens now. Okay. Pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second. Yeah. You're going to do this six hundred times or until help can take over. Do not stop what you are doing. I'm not, I'm not, Do I'm not, not stop. I'm not. Good. Let the chest come all the way up between the pumps. Oh. Count, oh. count out loud. You're doing really well. Oh. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. This helps with circulating the oxygen. One, okay. two, three, oh. four. And do not stop moving. One, two. Three, oh, four. One, two, three, Fiona Schupin had just finished making a cup of coffee and was preparing to pick up her children from school. In the midst of that, she collapsed. Her quick-thinking partner, Wong, called triple zero. Guided by an emergency operator, Lynette Bell, Wong began CPR while waiting for assistance. The ambulance arrived six minutes later and they took over. Wong had learned CPR 30 years ago but found it came back to him with Bell's help. He said, she kept me calm and spoke me through things. She was very, very good. Thankfully, Shupin woke up in the hospital four days later. She received a cardiac arrest survivor award from NSW Ambulance while Wong was presented with a savior award. Wong was also praised for performing well to save his partner's life, regardless of the stress and pressure. For more True 911 calls, watch this episode next.